Now unlike Rockstar's other hits such as Grand Theft Auto and Red Dead, Buddy has you take the role of 15 year old boy Jimmy Hopkins, a troubled boy from a troubled background. And the entire game takes a more relaxed approach to the sandbox genre. As opposed to the run and gun style of Grand Theft Auto, Bully takes an incredibly unique approach to the Rockstar formula and definitely the most unique and enjoyable experience I've ever had in a sandbox game. So let's take a quick trip down memory lane. Now I first got Bully all the way back in spring 2008 on the PlayStation 2. I remember reading about it in an older copy of a PlayStation 2 magazine which had a review on it and I knew just from reading about the game I would absolutely love it. At the time however, the only other Rockstar game I had played was Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories, which I also absolutely adored at the time. And seeing these reviews compare Buddy to GTA excited me even more to go and try it. Because one of the things I loved about Liberty City Stories at the time, honestly, was just exploration, and Liberty City as a whole. I know this is a Buddy review, but this definitely ties in. Like, when I was 10, I would just spend hours upon hours just like exploring Liberty City, doing missions, driving around, and even though I did that all pretty awfully, I would occasionally make up my own stories about Tony, you know, like becoming a cop or something, or the hero, you know, because that hero garbage feet, and, you know, all that really cringy stuff you'd come up with as a kid. And reading about this game called Canis Canem Edit, because I'm in the UK and Bully's name was changed here, take everything I loved about Liberty City stories, and take it to a place much more relatable to me at the time, the schoolyard, in a small town, where you play as a young boy. Now, before I got it, I must have read through the article about 20 times while saving my pocket money to afford it well, at least a pre-owned copy, which was about £15 at the time, and when I had enough saved, I gave my mum the money to go and get it for me. I mean, I was 10 at the time, so it cut me some slack. Now, the first time I even put the PS2 disc in was really, really memorable to me. As I sat down and watched Jimmy back chat his parents in the intro and seeing the various shots of the academy alongside this ominous music, it perfectly set the tone. I don't think the game's intro could have been done in any better way. It sets up the story in a very nice but basic way, like we know Jimmy isn't a resident of Fallworth, we can see his troubled background and we know why he's going to the academy. And as I walked into the academy, I remember saying to myself how the building of Bullworth actually looked a bit like the school I was going to in September. Well, the outside of it anyway. Which, looking back 11 years later, is actually a little bit true because the academy's design is seemingly based off Pets College in Scotland. No, obviously I never went there, but it means the academy's design was a bit more British in that sense, and it really struck me in a positive way. So after meeting with the headmaster, Dr. Crabblesnitch, I could instantly tell this was the game I was wishing for. Then making my way to the dorm, I was given a fighting tutorial, and it was here I completely realised that Buddy was not like GTA Liberty City stories in any way, shape or form. As one of the major changes that made Buddy stand out compared to Grand Theft Auto is the heavier emphasis on close quarter combat fighting instead of guns, with the game giving you the ability to mix up your combos as you see fit, as opposed to just, you know, generic punches and kicks like GTA had, alongside some combos being really effective against certain types of people more than others. And this was introduced really early on in the game, and I feel that was partly a design choice to let players know that Buddy is not a GTA type of game, but instead its own branch of Rockstar's GTA formula. Of course, at the very beginning of the game, you do have a very, very basic moveset to move from, those just being basic punch combos and grabbing, that's really it. For the beginning fighting tutorial, this was actually perfect for me, it wasn't too overwhelming for me, a new player, and it hasn't been for many other people, nor was it too easy. Now as said, Buddy's major playing style is fist to fist combat, like, if you want to learn new moves and combos, rather than just gradually unlocking them by playing, you have to attend classes or give stuff to a homeless man to get them. I feel that kind of approach gives a player an actual reason to go and search out these collectibles, or attend classes, as these combos you learn can be pretty devastating when used correctly. And the various characters you meet at Bullworth all have their own varying styles depending on their size and click, which is something I've always liked how most characters have a completely different style that really suits them. It gives the clicks a lot more of a personality in my opinion, and made them stand there compared to GTA where, no matter your enemy, they always felt the same, just like, you know, different skins with different guns and that. Like, for example, you have the preppies who specialise in boxing, but then you have the nerds who can't fight for their lives and that. And even then, if you compare individual characters, like say, let's take Algernon, a nerd, whose style is clearly affected by his weight, and compare him to say, somebody like Sheldon, who is basically pint-sized and he can't fight at all, so from like shoving you a little bit. For newer players too, if you go around picking fights, you'll quickly learn who's not to be messed with, and some characters are absolute powerhouses and can easily wipe out new players. Or if not that, you will quickly find yourself cornered by like 6 members of the same group. It really keeps you in check until you're more experienced with the controls. Now when it comes to fighting, Jimmy automatically blocks everything too, while every other character has a small chance of blocking. I find this a little bit of a weird choice as Rockstar released the Warriors before Bully, and there's leftover files which do sort of hint at Buddy's fighting was going to be more like the Warriors, which if you played, you know you have to manually block and dodge yourself instead of just, you know, blocking everything automatically. Now, of course, Buddy does have weapons, but they're handled much differently compared to most other games. For example, in nearly every game I've played, weapons are usually handled in one or two ways. 
either the player has a weapon wheel of sorts, you know, where they can use a lot of weapons, which is more common in other sandbox games like Grand Theft Auto and Saints Row, Red Dead and all that, where you can use a pistol, but then you can swap it to like an RPG or a rifle or whatever you like, really. There's no restrictions on what you can really pick up unless they're sort of like in the same class. Or the player is restricted to like two or three weapons, and you can only pick up and replace weapons. Now, Buddy handles this weirdly, like, you still do have the weapon wheel, which has Jimmy's slingshot, firecrackers, itching powder, marbles, and all that which is like traditional in a sandbox game. But at the same time, all the melee weapons cannot be stored in Jimmy's inventory, but can only be picked up or stolen from other people, a bit like in FPS games after you kill someone. And as said, these melee weapons can't be stored either, so if you pick up a bat and then swap it to a slingshot, Jimmy just drops the bat. It's a slightly weird design choice in my opinion, though writing this script up and thinking about it, it makes more sense when I realise that the weapons in Jimmy's inventory are basically the projectile weapons he can use. Most of them aren't even actual weapons anyway, like we do have the marbles which just trip people up, we have the itching powder which just like makes people scratch themselves, leaving them defenceless, stink bombs obviously just sort of like stop people in their tracks, you get the idea on that. Now where the weapons you can store in Jimmy's inventory are very restricted, like you can't store a thousand firecrackers or a thousand bottle rockets, you're extremely restricted to a set amount, which is like about five firecrackers or so. Of course these vary depending on the weapon but you get the idea. Now the only exception to this is Jimmy's slingshots which for some reason have infinite ammo, also, the melee weapons aren't even infinite like they were in GTA, they will break eventually. Now, I really like this approach, as to me at least, it sort of makes you be a bit more tactical with your fighting, and sometimes makes you realise that using a spud gun on someone like a nerd is a massive waste, but saving that ammo for like the jocks or an upcoming mission might actually be worth it. Now, speaking of the weapons in the game, there is a lot. Now, while Jimmy's usual weapon wheel is definitely smaller compared to the like of, you know, San Andreas or Vice Cities, all these melee weapons, and throwables to an extent, actually make up for that. Like we have bricks, we have pipes, baseball bats, water balloons, brooms, vases, etc. Also, with Buddy Weapons Wheel, half the weapons Jimmy gets aren't actual weapons that deal damage, as mentioned earlier, like the stink bomb just stops people, miles will trip people up on that. I honestly feel this is an incredibly unique approach to combat, as you can be really tactical in some fights where you're outnumbered. Like if you've got the jocks on your case, you can just run away and throw marbles behind you, they'll just trip and you can escape safely. Now, as we know, one of the things that makes sandbox games really great and appealing is the free roam content the game offers as it provides us with a lot of content to enjoy after the game's main story is completed, or stuff to do alongside it when we want to take a break from it and just screw around for a while. Now, Buddy's free mode content thankfully isn't lacking, there's loads to do such as like finding the collectibles around the map, doing the side missions, races and classes etc. Now, these alone should provide most people with a good few hours worth of content. The classes are definitely one of the more outstanding activities to the game and give you rewards for Jimmy. The subjects we get are Chemistry, English, Art, Gym, Shop Class and Photography on the PlayStation 2, and for Scholarship Edition and Anniversary Edition we also get Biology, Music, Geography and Math, and all the PS2 classes. Plus Geography from Scholarship Edition gives us upgrades that only slightly change our playstyle, while the other three from Scholarship just give us clothes. Now all the classes are in the form of minigames, and like all the other minigames they do have multiple levels to them, where they're all themed after their respective subject, like English class has you trying to find words from scrambled letters, and art has you drawing Miss Phillips than that. They all handle fantastically and really integrate well into the game and the game's theme. The rewards you get are somewhat relevant to the subject you took as well. Like English makes Jimmy more well spoken, and even given the ability to worm your way out of trouble and use better insults, while Geography Class gives you more use to the map as it marks all the collectibles for us. It's really, really well done. Now, side missions, as mentioned in my story review, are just missions that don't add or take anything away to Jimmy's story. But instead, they give the spotlight to other minor characters and their own little stories. Like Edna the Cook trying to go on a date with Dr. Watts, and Jimmy helps out with that. Or Beatrice being upset because Mr. Hattrick took her diary away, and Jimmy goes to get it for her. Like, take the Hattrick vs. Galloway storyline as a fine example. It starts in Chapter 2, in Autumn, but the next mission for Mr. Galloway's story isn't available until Winter, where Jimmy offers to trash Hattrick's house for him. The next two missions don't happen until Chapter 4, where the story comes to an end in Chapter 5. Absolutely no effect on Jimmy's rivalry with the Greasers, or the Preps, or Gary, or whatever, or you know, Jimmy being unpopular. Now, if you didn't bother doing these when they became available, no worries because you can do them after the main storyline is finished anyway. Now, the downside to this, however, is it really does speed up the story progression. Like, you know, you can trash Hattrick's house, but the next day, you know, Galloway's put in the mental asylum, and the very next day, he's back and Hattrick's fired, you get the idea. Now, these missions are great for the most part, and I won't repeat what I've said in my story video, so to save time, let's get onto some of my nitpicks. Like, one of the glaring issues with some of these missions is they very clearly take place in specific chapters. Like, take character sheets for an example. It's one of the last side missions available in Chapter 1, and focuses on Melvin having his Grottos and Gremlins card stolen by the bullies. Now, past Chapter 1, the bullies are on good terms with Jimmy, and they remain that way forever. 
but if this is done in say chapter 4, the buddies will be hostile to Jimmy for this mission only and it sort of does disrupt the flow when the buddies hate you for no reason, but then love you again straight after. Now Buddy was also the first Rockstar game to introduce encounters, I guess you could call them that, but this game calls them errands. Now these are just insanely short tasks that Jimmy would be asked to do by anybody who's either having an issue or just wants to cause trouble and they do vary. Now the reason I said encounters is because in Buddy these tasks do pop up at very specific times with specific characters, you know much like they do in GTA 5 or Red Dead Redemption 2. For example, one of these errands might ask Jimmy to go and collect something for them, one might ask him to lay down tags, and you know, these are far from challenging, and they just make for nothing more than a really quick reward, which is usually money, occasionally clothes. Now, I feel most of these are just like, there to put the game's features to real quick use. Like, you can go through the entire game without ever putting somebody into a locker, yet you will get an errand to ask you to do just that. Same also goes for lockpicking, escorting, and even lobbing water balloons. You can go the entire game without doing any of this stuff. And in a way, I really like this because it gives you a really quick reward just to use a feature Rockstar put into the game, and it also counts towards 100%. So this is a very, very clever way of Rockstar getting you to use every single feature they added into the game. Even the really obscure ones are putting firecrackers down the toilet are given their own errand. I really do love this sly approach because it shows Rockstar really wanted all their features to be used, and completionists will have to do them. Now for side activities, Buddy doesn't lack there either. You can partake in racing in the form of go-karts, bikes, dodgeball, the carnival, you know, jobs in the form of paper routes, lawn mowing, and even arcade games. Now pretty much all of these are just quick mini games lasting a few minutes each, but all of these keep going up in difficulty. Like for example, for bike races, minus the academy, they all have about four or so levels, with each getting slightly more difficult with a different track. Once all 12 races are done, there's one final race at the academy which is unlocked. And of course, as expected, it's the hardest and the most lengthiest. Now, for go-karts, these are at the carnival, but there's about five levels, plus three street races, two being an old war fail, and one in Blue Skies Industrial Park. And doing all of these will take you about 20 to 30 minutes to do, providing you win, of course. Also, the last race is in Blue Skies Industrial Park, which isn't unlocked in Chapter 5, and you can't get there without exploiting the game. But once you've beaten all the races, you do get arguably the best reward in the entire game. A go-kart to use whenever you want, and it will always be found outside Jimmy's garage at the school. Now this is what a reward should be, it's a fun reward that can make the game even more fun and even adds a new way of playing, in a way, and can make some parts of the game even easier if you unlock it early enough. Now one nitpick I do have from this, aside from the final level, is you actually can't replay any of the races. Like say you beat all the races in Ball of Town, you can only replay the fourth one. Same goes for the go-karts, you can't really replay any aside from the fifth race. It's kind of a letdown in my opinion, and this is an issue that plagues Buddy quite a lot. The lack of replayability on these activities. And this doesn't just affect races, it also affects classes, jobs, and missions, you know. But once you've beaten them, you cannot replay them again. Well, you can, but only at the last level. And some classes, like gym and photography, just completely disappear after you've beaten them. And this really does hurt replayability quite a lot, as you're just heavily restricted to the final levels of races and classes. Now weirdly enough, after beating Gym 5, you can play dodgeball against random clicks, and I feel this should have been added to the classes in a way. Or, you know, being able to choose completed races and that. And yes, before somebody says it, you cannot replay missions either. That feature was first introduced in GTA The Ballad of Gay Tony. So once you've beaten a mission, you just can't replay it whenever you want. You have to make a backup save before that mission. Though in fairness, this was an issue in every single Rockstar game up until the release of Ballad of Gay Tony, so yeah. But... You know, in GTA 5, Red Dead Redemption 2 and that, you do have the option to replay missions whenever you want, so I do think this will be one feature Rockstar will keep in all their future games. Of course, the only way you can actually replay missions in Bully is through modding, but obviously, you know, modding isn't for everybody, and if you're on console, then you're pretty much shit out of luck. So, yeah, I'm not counting modding as a way to sort of do that anyway. Now, much like the previous GTA games, Bully does have various collectibles around the map in the form of rubber bands, garden gnomes, Grotters and Gremlins cards, pumpkins, yearbook photos, tombstones, and radio transistors. Now some of these, like the Halloween decorations, will only appear in Chapter 1, but if you fail to smash them all, don't worry, Rockstar just shoves them all into a single place for you, or in the pumpkins case, the basement in the very next mission after Halloween. Now the rest of the stuff like dodgeball, gambling, the arcade and that are just really short mini games lasting a minute or so, dodgeball is unlocked through beating all the gym classes, where you can play against all the other clicks, except the buddies, and there's no reward to do this however. Now gambling obviously is just a quick game where Jimmy can bet his money in activities, these being keep ups, um, knocking Constantine off out by kicking a football up his ass, and midget wrestling. Now keep ups is probably the only challenging one here, 
and you know, I still did have a bit of trouble with this. Now Constantinos is really easy to do and midget wrestling can be very easily exploited. Like if your chosen midget is losing just quickly run away and your money is refunded. The gambling here is also handled rather poorly. And while I'm not expecting Jimmy to visit Las Vegas, well Venturas should I say, and strike it rich playing blackjack, I wish there was a bit more difficulty to them. You know keep ups was probably the only balanced game because the others are just way too easy and exploitable. Now the arcade machines first introduced in GTA San Andreas do make a return here and are found in all of Jimmy's safe houses and the carnival prize tent. Now while there are no rewards for this, these games are mostly all fun. Well that and they do add to 100% completion providing you beat the high score. There's about 4 different arcade games you can play, these being Future Street Racer, Consumo, Monkey Fling and Nutshots. Now Future Street Racer is just a top down racer, although there is a different version which plays in proper 3D. But these tracks are the same across both versions so depends which version you feel is better. There's about 3 levels in this game and they're great for a quick racer so. Now I'm not an expert on this part but I did always get a slight F-Zero vibe from this so any F-Zero fans watching you might actually love this game. Now I actually wrote this script prior to my easter egg video where it turns out this entire minigame is heavily inspired by the Wipeout franchise with a little bit of F-Zero mixed in. Now Consumo is a seemingly Rockstar original game, although I might be wrong on that, where you control a sumo wrestler to get as fat as possible by eating fish, apples and pies, but avoiding blowfish, mouldy food and other sumo wrestlers. The larger you get, the faster and larger the other items appear, which is great for adaptive difficulty and there isn't really much strategy to this game, it's just pure luck and reflex which I think is a great choice because it's one of those games where you can never win, but you can try and beat your high score. Definitely a great minigame that we had here, although Nerd Challenge does make this game an absolute bitch. And it's probably why it became so unpopular because, well, let's be honest, as I mentioned in my um, unpopular missions video, well my personal hated missions video, that mission really did turn me off it. Now Nutshots is a 2D auto side scrolling shooter where you play as a squirrel shooting hornets with nuts, who in turn try to sting you, alongside bats and eagles. It's alright I guess, personally I was never too fond of this minigame, I just found it to be a bit meh. You know, I don't hate it, but it's not something I'd really play. It's also one of the more difficult games Body has to offer, I feel. And Monkey Fling. It's just basically a game where you control a monkey and just fling shit at bananas to make them fall while avoiding spiders. A bit like Nutshots, it's just on the mess side for me, don't have any strong opinions either way. Personally, I just don't like it, you know, much. I think it's probably the worst arcade game Body has to offer, but that's just my opinion. Now, mentioned a bit earlier, while the previous GTA games had stuff like oysters, horseshoes and hidden packages, collecting them all would give you a kind of bonus. Like in San Andreas, taking all the photos around the map would give you weapons outside CJ's garage in San Piero, or tagging every grocery tag would give CJ weapons in his home. None of the collectibles in Bully, aside from the rubber band, really give Jimmy any weapons. They just give him stupid outfits to wear and to get laughed at in. With the exception of the Black Ninja outfit which is obtained by taking every student's yearbook photo, None of these outfits even do anything anyway, and in case you're wondering, once you've taken every yearbook photo, the Black Ninja outfit is unlocked and while wearing it, in full that is, it will keep the trouble meter disabled when trespassing or being outside after curfew. Well there are two other outfits which do slightly alter the game, one being the mascot outfit which lets you do the dance and you aren't allowed to use certain weapons, and the orderly outfit which just lets you speak to prefects respectfully. That's it, not exactly like, you know, a massive game changer. Now if you're wondering, the reward for collecting the garden gnomes is... A gnome outfit. And you know, collecting all the Grottos and Gremlins cards just gives Jimmy a Grotto of Master outfit. You know, you can't play Grottos and Gremlins and, and there's no real benefit to wearing these costumes so yeah. Now collecting all 70 rubber bands does give you the rubber band ball in Jimmy's weapon wheel permanently and this weapon is surprisingly good fun. It can knock everybody down and when it's used inside Titan series like the Boy Storm with the fire alarm pool, you can see some real chaos. But with that being said, there was actually a glitch which could cause you to lose it. I'm not too sure what the cause of the glitch is, with some saying that saving the game after quickly throwing the ball could cause you to lose it forever. Now overall, I feel the rewards to most of the collectibles was just a bit poor. The rubber band ball, go-kart and black ninja outfits were great rewards for what you get, but everything else was just meh at best in my opinion. You don't feel as rewarded as you would do for collecting and completing stuff in Rockstar's other games. Now the Halloween masks are acceptable I guess since they're not really being pushed as like, you know, the traditional Rockstar collectibles. But I would say some of the Scottish Edition outfits like the Alien one should have been used as a reward since you know it's more like of a Halloween costume kind of thing, you know an alternate Halloween costume. Like it would be nice to have more exclusive weapons or outfits that alter the gameplay more. But speaking of that though, even getting 100% in the game is a bit of a major disappointment. You just do not get anything. 
except for maybe an achievement on the Xbox and mobile versions, but nothing to really reward you in-game for it. But most games I've played usually do have something to give you, be it in-game rewards, you know, like how San Andreas gave you infinite ammo, a tank and a hydra spawn in Grove Street and that. Or even Spyro the Dragon 2, you know, Ripto's Rage gave you permanent super breath. And you don't even get anything like an alternate bonus ending scene like Red Dead Redemption 2 or Crash to Insanity did. It's just a major letdown for those of us who were just expecting something that we got in the previous games. Now while I can't think of any actual in-game reward, I would have honestly loved a 100% bonus ending scene with say like Jimmy leaving the academy and going back home. Just like a nice nod that basically says Jimmy's done everything he needs to do, it's time to go home and put Wolf Academy behind him as his story comes to a complete close. Now as we all know, soundtracks are arguably one of the most important aspects to any game, movie or TV show, as it adds emotion, atmosphere and can really make a break or scene entirely. For example, if you go and look up say soundtracks from Spyro the Dragon or Super Mario 64, you'll often see a load of comments from fans saying how much they remember the soundtrack from their past. Or soundtracks from incredibly depressing games like Life is Strange or Red Dead where a particular song is ingrained into a specific scene, which obviously I can't say for spoiler reasons, where fans will say how that song made them tear up. Now luckily, Buddy's soundtrack doesn't disappoint here, as Buddy's soundtrack is pretty much universally loved by most people who've played it, with many saying it's their favourite, or at the very least in their top 10. Now the soundtrack relies on purely original tracks, instead of a licensed soundtrack like the GTA series has gone through. The compositions also don't really fit any specific genres, as each track is unique in its own way. Like for example, the walking theme, in my opinion, has a somewhat upbeat yet melancholy beat, while the jock theme has more of a sporty kind of rhythm, and the Finding Johnny Vincent track has more of an extremely mysterious tone, and the Greasers have more of a 1950s style guitar riff. Now many fans also consider Sean Lee to be the real face behind the soundtrack, and it wouldn't be the same without him, and I completely agree. Sean Lee is the heart of the Buddy soundtrack, much like Stuart Copeland is to the original Spyro the Dragon trilogy, or Woody Jackson to Red Dead, or Simon Vicklund to Payday. Those are probably the best comparisons I can think of anyway. Now also, by having a purely original soundtrack, Buddy has been completely protected in the re-releases for Scholarship Edition and Anniversary. Unlike Grand Theft Auto where in the mobile port, some of the most iconic tracks were cut because of licensing issues. Now this was probably the best choice for Buddy and it's aged like wine when compared to say GTA 4 or San Andreas. With, you know, GTA 4 being majorly overhauled in 2018 due to licensing issues to many fans' disappointment. Now thankfully, GTA 4 was not pulled entirely like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater HD was from Steam, Xbox 360 and PS3, but that is always a concern with copyrighted soundtracks because had Rockstar not removed the tracks from GTA, they would have been forced to pull them from downloadable purchase. I apologise for getting slightly off topic there, but I do think that is why Buddy's purely original soundtrack was a fantastic design choice. Buddy will never be pulled for copyright reasons. However, like with everything, it's not 100% perfect. And no, I do not hate the soundtrack by any means, and I do consider it in my top 5, behind Tony Hawk's American Wasteland. But the only thing I really dislike about the soundtrack is how it just restarts whenever anything happens. But like the walking theme could be halfway through, you hop on a bike and then the walking theme just restarts again when you hop off it. In my honest opinion, it's a bit worse in missions that have a heavy enemy count, you know like the tenements, where you just have constant fights until you beat up Norton. I just hope that in Bully 2 or even GTA 6 I can mix in the tracks a bit better, so it has more of a seamless transition instead of just restarting all the time. Now most of Buddy's tracks do have three versions, low, medium and high, with low being played when nothing is happening and high being played when the action gets intense, and I feel the slight mixing could work beautifully and not disrupt the flow of the track at all. Like if you have the tracks ripped you can actually make a pretty seamless mix from low to medium to high anyway. Now, a bit of a side note, exclusive to the PC version, Rockstar actually bundled the official soundtrack with the game for free and can be found in the Buddy folder, which I do think is great as the soundtrack itself is like £10 on iTunes UK. So being bundled with Steam for like £3.74, when on sale that is, is an absolute steal there. Even then, if you do not like the soundtrack and you decide to mute it, you can hear some insane sound design Rockstar used which I've never seen that many people mention. I don't just mean like San Andreas either where you might hear gunshots or police sirens in the distance, I mean different sound details for different times and different parts of the map. I'll give examples here for my attention to detail video. Now this is honestly brilliant, it shows Rockstar poured a lot of effort into making Buddy's sound design as great as they possibly can, and I really do think this is one of the lesser talked about things when people talk about Buddy because not many people dislike the soundtrack. 
I've always seen some high price for Sean's work, but very rarely any for the ambience tracks, even if they're just stock sound effects that implemented so well. However, once again, I do have something to moan about, because depending on what version of the game you're playing, punching and character voices will be different. For example, on the PlayStation 2, there's an oddly satisfying sound when you punch somebody or lob a firecracker. However, character voices outside of cutscenes are always incredibly low quality. So, now let's get onto the map, as the map is arguably one of the most important things about any sandbox game. Now, unlike Grand Theft Auto, which usually takes place in a city, Buddy instead takes place in a rather small town, with no obvious inspirations as to what town Borth is supposed to be. Like, when you play Grand Theft Auto, you can clearly tell Rockstar inspired the cities around real life American ones, as there's obvious parodies and signs of inspiration all around the map. But Bullworth doesn't have anything like this. Now, the colours of Bullworth, especially on the PlayStation 2 version, are incredibly dull and boring, but that is not a bad thing, because I think Bullworth's lack of colour perfectly sets the scene, because it shows we're far away from the concrete jungle of Liberty City and the bright neon lights and heavy party life of Vice City and Las Venturas. We're just in your average small town, where nothing big or interesting ever really happens. Now that being said, the colours do become more vibrant on Scholarship Edition and Anniversary Edition, and personally I'm not a fan of this as I feel the drab and dull colour scheme of the PS2 is just much more fitting to the overall tone of Bullworth. And I think the drab and dull colour scheme of Bullworth actually does fit Jimmy's mood perfectly, because you can tell he doesn't want to be a Bullworth either. Now the map of Bullworth is split up into six areas. We've got the School, Bullworth Town, Old Bullworth Vale, the Carnival, New Commentary and Blue Skies Industrial Park and each area is completely different and represents life in Bullworth very differently. Like for example, Old Bullworth Vale is the upper class area where the preppies live. This side of town is mostly clean, you don't see much crime going on, however in New Commentary, which is near enough the exact opposite of the map, it's a rundown area where greasers and townies are found, crime is very commonplace, there's barely any shops for Jimmy to go to, and many of the buildings here are abandoned or severely damaged. Now I always felt the vibe of the areas was much more realistic, like, you know, the kind of vibe where if sat out you're around the um, tenements at night, for example, it's honestly the kind of place where, in reality, you probably would get robbed, or, you know, there's probably a drug den nearby. The whole vibe of Bullworth was handled perfectly, like, just saying, you know, with new commentary, it was handled excellently in how unsafe it felt to really be there as Jimmy. And seeing the greasers going around harassing people really added to the atmosphere. While in Old Bullworth Vale, it generally felt a bit safer as you didn't really see any crime and that part of the map was kept nice and clean. The preppies rarely went around harassing people as well. Now the carnival in Old Bull Fail, in my opinion, is actually a really unique area since it just seems to be more of a minigame hub kind of area. As the carnival houses pretty much all of Buddy's minigames, from all the arcade minigames in the prize tent to the games Jimmy can play around it, like the baseball toss, a shooting range, testing your strength and even dunking a midget. And you don't really need to do any of these outside of one mission in chapter 2, but I feel the carnival is a great area in the game for the player to take a break from the story or just to screw around. Like, I used to spend a lot of time here during my first few playthroughs. Now, just to break away a little bit here, I actually do think Happy Vault Asylum is one of the most memorable parts of Buddy's map, and it actually scared me when I was a kid. And no, I don't mean the Johnny Vincent mission either. The first time I was playing Buddy, I was on chapter 4, and I was running down, like, the pathway to get to Ernest's observatory to do a mission, and I noticed this cave was open. So I run down it, and I run down the other cave, and as soon as I came out the other side, I just hear this, like, loud wind, I see this weird building, and as I went around the corner I just saw the sign of Happy Vaults Asylum. Now this actually terrified me because my only knowledge of insane asylums at the time was from a recently released horror film, in Sanitarium, and of course, you know, thanks to cartoons and that, just places where they put you in a straitjacket and just lock you away. So I legged it back down the caves because I genuinely thought Jimmy would get kidnapped or something, and god forbid when I had to do the Finding Johnny Vincent mission, because at the time, that mission was on par with Courage the Cowardly Dog for scariness back then. I mean, give me a break, I was like 10. But yeah, the entire Asylum ambience is unsettling and made the entire mission the worst thing ever for me. But with that being said, the ambience is handled perfectly. It's like, you know you shouldn't be there. It's really out of place compared to the rest of Buddy's world and the only other place in the game that ever made me feel the same level of unease and a little bit fear as Happy Faults was the Repcon site in Fallout New Vegas. Even though I only played that night 2018, I still had that feeling of I don't want to be here, and thankfully skipped the Night King just by killing Jason instead, because I am a coward. And I know for a fact, if I had the same choice in Bully, back when I first discovered the Asylum, I probably would have left Johnny there. I hated the Asylum, but obviously got more and more custom to it the more I played. It really doesn't help, like, how in the back there's an actual morgue, and, you know, there's all these weird x-rays. So it's really not hard to see why so many people find the Asylum to be completely unsettling. Now, the town of Bullworth was a nice addition, and it's arguably a hub for the player to just go and buy stuff and customise Jimmy, as not many missions even had you going into the town to begin with. 
while other areas such as New Commentary and The Vale would be in the main areas of their own respective chapters. Now, the Academy itself is definitely what most people remember when they think of Buddy. It's definitely an iconic area, partly because the Academy is something we don't see very often in a violent sandbox game, a school. That alone made the map stand out, as in pretty much every other sandbox game I've ever played, I don't think any of them have actually had full on schools make an appearance in any way, shape or form. Now this is partly why Buddy was so controversial when it came out, because people knew the setting, and they knew Rockstar's previous games, Grand Theft Auto and Manhunt, and many people thought that this was just going to be a GTA set in a school, and it'd be teaching us how to shoot up schools. And honestly, I feel a second Buddy game would definitely raise the same complaints. Because a lot of people just generally don't feel comfortable with a violent video game set in the schoolyard. And of course, while we know that Buddy doesn't feature anything of the sort, many people just don't care enough to actually realise that. They just see like, a school setting, they see a publisher like Rockstar who are known for making violent video games, and they just immediately jump to the conclusion that, like I said, Buddy will just teach you how to shoot up a school. And I'm just going to repeat myself, but it needs to be said, like, you know, it's one of those things where like the location of Bully is just unique, but at the same time it's really controversial and quite ballsy of Rockstar. Because how many other games can you name that have been set in a school? Well, I mean I know you could say like Harry Potter, but you know, I'm on about like games rather than movies. Well, movie based games should I say. I can't really think of many. I think like probably the only other one I can think of is like Life is Strange. But even then, that wasn't like, you know, that wasn't anything like Buddy at all. That was a completely different game, completely different tones, and, well, you get the idea. There has never been a sandbox game set inside a school aside from Buddy, and that is definitely why Buddy's map stands out. And, honestly, it's really ballsy of Rockstar, especially given the climate of um, tragedies in America. I feel that a second Buddy would definitely raise the same concerns as the first game did, and all of you know how much I love the game. And I do honestly think that Rockstar will probably raise some eyebrows. Obviously to gamers they won't, because gamers are pretty much like familiar with Buddy. I mean, most of you probably are now, that's why you're watching this. But to most other people who don't really play games, they won't care. Anyway, I apologise for getting off topic there, but I hope you understand what I mean when I say like the Academy is really unique in a ballsy kind of sense. Now, even though the Academy itself is a single area, the area itself is split up into single parts. We have the dorms, the library, the gym, the auto shop, and Harrington House. Now much like the parts of the town, the various cliques do spawn in different areas, and I think this was a fantastic way to sort of teach a player about how the map outside of the academy works. Like with the auto shop, you never really see like, any of the nerds there, it's just all greaser turf. Much like how in the map itself, New Coventry is greaser turf, and you'll rarely see anybody else down there, aside from townsfolk obviously. I also think it's a bit realistic in how at school, or even your own town, certain gangs will hang out at certain areas, and everybody knows that, and in Buddy's case, and sometimes real life, it's usually not a good idea to go there by yourself, especially if you're not on good terms with them, and especially more so if they're a violent gang. It's also represented quite well when you see like a nerd go near jock territory, a fight will break out almost instantly, or if say like you head down blue skies, you know, the townies will just jump you for no specific reason, which I think really does like portray the crime ridden area quite well. Now pretty much all of the map is used over the course of the story, with chapters 1 and 4 being set in the academy, chapter 2 being set in the Vale, chapter 3 being set in New Coventry, and chapter 5 being set all over town. Now pretty much none of the map, aside from the Great Big Ocean and the Carnival, and the power plant really go to waste. Even then the Carnival was only there as like a mini game hub in the ocean, I don't really know to be honest, it just houses a pirate easter egg and some collectibles, but aside from that it's just empty. And the same sort of goes to the power plant, like, it's used as this towny hideout apparently, and it's locked off until like, you complete busting in part 2, which is like the second to last mission in the game. But if you go there in free mode, there's no one there, like, there's no NPCs, there's no townies, you can smash crates, but it's just really, really empty and, I don't know, it just feels a bit off in some ways, like you can't even enter the power plant either, so it's just like a real wasted area there. Now, one of the things that made Buddy stand its own against every other Rockstar map, yes, even Red Dead Redemption 2, is how Buddy has changed in seasons. As you progress through the game, starting in autumn, you notice that the map changes very slightly to adjust to the season. And no, this isn't like how other games handled it at the time. You know, like, say, um, on specific dates, games would, like, change weather. You know, like, uh, I think it was Simpsons Hit and Run, where on, um, if your console clock was set to certain dates, Homer would be, um, in, like, I think it was either Halloween outfit or... Was it Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter? You get the idea. 
But Bully doesn't do anything like that. Like, um, all of the seasons are pretty much predetermined by whatever chapter you're on. So sadly, you can't start up Bully in, say, December and the Academy will be coated over in snow or, you know, you won't see Christmas decorations. Now, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2, you know, there's not much green to be seen on the trees. But when you get to Chapter 3, the entirety of Bullworth is completely snowed over and the entire town's dark and drab colours are now gone in favour for a blanket of white snow. Now, one attention to detail many people might not notice here is, at the beginning of Chapter 3, the entire map's colour scheme is just white and grey, mostly. But as you progress to the end of the chapter, the skies become much more vibrant, becoming like a nice bright blue and pink, which goes together incredibly well with the snow and gives off that real feeling of like a cold yet sunny winter. Now, much like San Andreas and Vice City, there's plenty of safe houses you can unlock across Bullworth. And thankfully, the amount of safe houses you get are toned down from San Andreas, which seemingly had one on every single street. And unlike Vice City or San Andreas, all of these houses are unlocked through missions instead of buying them. And also, unlike San Andreas, which did reuse a lot of interiors, Buddy's safe houses were always different. You had the dorm, which was tight and cramped. You had the beach house, which gave off a more relaxed vibe. I feel having only one safe house per section was a great choice for Buddy's incredibly small map. But we can sort of see how messy Buddy would have been with its constant save icons had it been more like San Andreas. Just by simply looking at the academy, where we have a save point at the Jocks Clubhouse, one at the school, and the dorm. Now while Bullworth is a mostly great map, the more you explore, the more you realise that it's just quite incomplete and there's a few inconsistencies around it. Especially around the school, like for example the exterior has three floors, yet the inside has two floors. And somehow entering the school from the back windows puts you at the west side of the map. And Harrington House has an entire forest behind you somehow. But in the main world, there are barely any trees on the path to the observatory. And the girls dorm is vastly different to the boys dorm, despite the fact there were only like about, what, 9 girls attending to about 60 something boys I think it is, and for some reason the basement has a driveway. Now all of these are the result of cut content, as during development the school did have 3 floors and the boys dorm had 2 floors, but when you notice it, it kind of feels like Rockstar half assed the map at certain points or just couldn't be bothered to match the interior to the exterior. Or maybe this was done to time constraints, it's just stuff like that that does ruin the map when you notice it. It's almost like, say, you download a map mod for, say, San Andreas where it turns CJ's house into a mansion, but you only install the interior so the outside stays the same, but inside CJ has like three floors and a pool, it's just inconsistent like that. And there are some weird design choices, especially when you look at cut content from the game and you see places like the boys dorm had both floors completed at one point, but then they removed them. Like, what was the point in that? Rockstar destroyed their own hard work here and it shows how crap the boys dorm is in the final game. The non-playable characters in Buddy were absolutely exceptional for the time. In previous Rockstar games, all NPCs did was just walk in a set path, drive in a set path and not do much else. They were mindless pigeons at best. But Buddy's NPCs are so much different. They're still mindless pigeons, but they're mindless pigeons with character and charm and they're fleshed out more than any of GTA's non-story NPCs. Every single character at the school has a name, first and a last name. Even the townsfolk have names, even though none of these have any actual role in the story. They all have varying quotes as well which do give them all kinds of personalities. Like as you roam about the campus after school you'll see small groups of people chatting in their clique about various things. Be it family life, moaning about teachers or classes, and yeah it was basic since this was 2006 we're talking about here, but I felt it added quite a little bit of realism and set the atmosphere incredibly well. Like as we walk around say the auto shop we might hear Lefty the Greaser talking about getting some action at the carnival, or if we go down the football field we might hear somebody like Dan the Jock trying to spread rumours about Darby Harrington and Biff Taylor being gay. It's the exact kind of stuff you would hear from teenagers talk about to their friends at school, especially for the time. Now in 2013 I actually did rip most of the characters audio files and upload them to YouTube, and most of the characters had about 5-10 to 10 minutes worth of quotes and when I did remove these because I had to comply um, with you know, the YouTube monetization policy and that, I had a lot of people from the fan fiction community tell me they really liked the quote videos because it really helped them get inspiration to what a character was like and how they could write them. And they could actually do so without like, you know, having to be near the character and just hear the same five quotes over and over again. Okay, that was a bit of an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. The characters are just really that well written, even those that have absolutely nothing to do with the story or any missions itself, like take um, Sheldon Thompson for example, he has absolutely no role in the story at all. All he does is just give Jimmy a few errands. But if you hang around him, you'll know that like, for some reason he's just a massive teacher's pet, and the teachers find him incredibly annoying. These characters have no right to be written this well, but they are, and 
honestly it's really great because it really makes all of them stand out. There's a lot of personality and there's a lot of charm to every single character in this game. Everybody in this game has personality and that, like, as I said just, they have no reason to be written that well but they really are. Now the characters and body are a perfect mix of being satire but at the same time being realistic enough they do remind us of people from our school years or people from school if you're still there. But like one of the major differences that separates Buddy's characters from like the PS2 era GTAs is how they act. For example, if you go to New Coventry, you'll see residents being harassed by the Greasers. You don't really see that in like GTA 3, Vice City or San Andreas. And I really love this because it feels more genuine than the other GTA cities. Because with the exception of say like CJ being on Ballers or Vargo's turf, the areas are generally the same, just with different pedestrians and different cars. Like in Las Venturas, you'll have the richer NPCs who, you know, drive fancy cars and wear expensive clothes, versus Angel Pine where it's just like crappy country cars and poor clothes. And there's no real risk to CJ being here because NPCs in the older GTA games didn't really do anything. Like in Buddy, if you enter New Country or Blue Skies, you will see Townsville getting harassed by greasers, you'll see police being called, fights breaking out, and all the stuff that makes the rougher areas feel much more dangerous to be around. And I do remember occasionally seeing a police chase in the hood through like Los Santos, but it wasn't really that common at all, at least for me. Unlike GTA where, as I said, you know, CJ can just walk through the hood but also last and chorus, but there's nothing really big happening unless the player causes a massive scene. And no, I'm not trying to say that, you know, GTA's AI is terrible or anything like that, but what I'm on about is how NPCs in the game can really make an area feel differently. Like if Buddy had its pets just walking around not doing anything unless provoked, it really wouldn't feel much different to like GTA at the time. I hope I'm really not coming off as slagging GTA off because I do love that franchise and yes I'm aware I'm comparing it a lot to like Bully in this but I feel the reason why is because a lot of people do compare GTA to Bully. You know be it the simple GTA in school remark or you know that kind of stuff. Anyway the various cliques around Bullworth do have a fair amount of turf around the map and each area of the map perfectly reflects the stereotype of the clique that inhabits it. Now I did mention this earlier when I was going over the map but the preppies, for example, are stereotypes of being upper class, posh and snobby. They inhabit Old Bull Vale and Harrington House. Now both of these areas are incredibly clean and fancy looking, compared to say the dropouts who inhabit Blue Skies, which is an incredibly run down, dirty, crime infested area. Another example is like the nerds, they don't have any specific place in town, instead they just rely on hanging out to the comic book store and the observatory, which is perfectly fitting into the nerdy stereotype of being anti-social and into comics. However, I do wish more was done with the jocks because they can only be found in one place in the game, and that is the sports area. Okay, granted, you know, you can see some of them at the carnival, but you know what I mean, they don't have their own dedicated area outside of the football field. Every other click except them can be found in other areas. I would have liked to have seen the jocks spawn near or maybe even inside the preppy's boxing gym because I do feel they would have been great there and it does appeal to the jocks love for sports and exercising. Now, while the teachers don't actually play a massive role in the story outside of well-being teachers and just hosting classes, I think they were represented well. Like Mr Galloway is that one teacher that most students really like because of his laid back and friendly personality. And Miss Phillips is that one teacher that many boys have a crush on. Mr Hattrick is that teacher that no student really likes because of his strict personality and possibly demeaning nature. Mr Burton is that weird teacher who may or may not have rumours being spread around him about him being a pervert or paedophile. And even Mr Wiggins for example, he doesn't teach any of Jimmy's classes, he doesn't even appear in the story, have any missions or errands. He's just like that one teacher you know nothing about, but you have seen him around school, but you've never had him teach any of your classes yourself, so you just have no strong opinion on him and you don't know anything about him and vice versa. Although, once again, a bit like the jocks, I do wish more was done with the teachers, as only a very small handful of them appear in missions, and they very, very, very rarely appear in free mode at all. Only really spawning at odd times without any warning. But anyway, let's get on to the humour of Bully. Now, as we know, Grand Theft Auto's humour relies incredibly strongly on satirising America, American culture, sex and drugs with many references being thrown around no matter where you are. Like on the in-game radio you will have adverts mocking American politics, both sides are lad, and there are in-game companies and logos with sexual innuendos, jabs at companies and much much more. Now Buddy's humour on the other hand relies rather heavily on satirising school life. Not just American school life but seemingly school life worldwide, relying on stereotypes, slapstick humour and exaggeration to the point you know it's satire, but at the same time the characters are somewhat realistic as I mentioned a while back. Now this plays in really well as someone like me from the UK can find Buddy satire to be really well done despite it being set in an American school. Rockstar manages this incredibly well, like some of the characters exaggerate personalities can remind you of people from your school or from your school years, but at the same time not keep it American centric like many of GTA's NPCs and references do with the American culture specific references or jabs. 
There are still a few GTA level drugs to be found in Bully, but they're much more subtle, like Happy Endings Retirement Home. Well, okay, I know that's not really as subtle as GTA's, but you get the idea. And if you don't get it, look up Happy Ending on Urban Dictionary or something, I'm not sure I can actually say it on this video. Now for character based humour, let's take the character Melvin O'Connor as a quick example. He's a nerd in the game whose quotes are heavily based around stereotypical nerd level gaming. Like how one of his quotes is him asking himself who has time for a real job. I just spent the last 8 hours making arrows in a video game. Which can probably remind us of that one guy from class who spends most of his spare time on one specific game. And Melvin's sort of gag, if you can call it that, is sort of backed up by Miss Danvers, who actually also has a quote, specifically naming Melvin for being responsible for playing games during class. Now, a majority of the preppies also fantastic examples of stereotype, but not exaggerate too much. Like Pinky, who has a spoiled little daddy's girl stereotype, or Gord, who might mock you for not wearing expensive clothes. Because I'm sure we all knew some stuck-up knob who thought he was better than everybody just because, like, his shoes cost a ten or more or whatever. Now, Bully humour also relies a lot more on characters rather than in-game signs and radios, like take the stink bomb weapon as an example. It doesn't really do anything to hurt people, but if the player chooses to throw it at like a group of people, they will always react with a funny remark. Same if you hit them in the bollocks. Now, depending on what you're doing, characters will always have a massive role in Bully humour, be it in fights where someone like Melvin will say he'll go snicker snacker on your ass with a vocal sword, or wedgies with like characters greatly overreacting to it. Now, Something that I find is a bit more unique to Buddy is though like, having random characters just doing this stuff too. Like sometimes you'll just see a character equipped with a firecracker, who will then just go and randomly throw it at a group of people who are minding their own business not doing anything, before prefects give chase or a massive fight breaks out. Now, that's actually hilarious when you just see like three people just like having one conversation, you know, not doing anything, and then somebody who seemingly has a grudge against them for no reason, lob a firecracker, and then just run off for no reason at all. Another bit of bully humour comes in the classic form of easter eggs, like how in the library there's a globe which Jimmy can spin and it gives you a real, yet odd fact about the world, which some people might find funny, like how in the UK it's perfectly legal to shoot a Scotsman with a bow and arrow in York, or the demotivating fortune teller which basically tells you that nobody likes you. And of course like, you know, building names like Spaz Industries to rival GTA's more adult jokes. Now this one might be a bit of an obscure reference because, like, spaz is a derogatory term for somebody who is disabled, not the spaz-12 shotgun. But anyway, you can just tell if this was GTA, you know, the build name would probably be a sexual innuendo. Or maybe it's say the same, hard to say really. But that being said, Buddy's humour might not appeal to everybody, and that's fine because we all have different levels of humour. What I find funny, you might not, and vice versa. But if you love more adult-oriented or borderline edgy humour, Buddy's humour might not appeal to you that much. But for what it's worth, I think Buddy's humour is handled incredibly well and pretty much all the jokes suit the game's setting and age range, and I think it really shows of how many people seem to really like Buddy's approach to it, with many people loving the jokes. And I don't think many jokes even fall that flat, aside from maybe the intentional ones with like Algie trying to be cool but coming off as cringy instead. Now even though Buddy is over 10 years old, well I was making this it's nearly 13 years old, I still think Rockstar near enough perfected the character customization with Buddy, with it being on par with GTA San Andreas in my opinion, and I'll explain why. You see, unlike other Rockstar games, especially GTA V, Buddy's clothing has barely any restrictions. Like you can make Jimmy wear boots and trousers, and the game just will not default Jimmy to shorts or something like GTA V or GTA Online does, which I think is great because we can dress Jimmy how we see him want him to. The clothing options we get in Buddy are a very wide variety too. We can have a nice upper class suit. You can make Jimmy look like a punk. We have sporty styles, smart styles, funny, and pretty much everything in between. We can make Jimmy into however we see him, be it after what your style is in real life, or how you think someone like Jimmy would dress. Now one thing I notice as well is Jimmy doesn't react to whatever you make him wear, not like GTA 5 where Michael clearly doesn't like wearing cheap clothes, and I think not having Jimmy react is a good design choice, because it feels like we have some control over Jimmy's fashion style, and whatever we choose for him, he's happy with. Now one of the things that Buddy and to an extent San Andreas has, that future games haven't, is the complete freedom of clothing choice. As mentioned, you can have Jimmy wearing boots and trousers and the game just will not force him to like, you know, some default outfit. Of course the only exceptions to this are like if Jimmy's in a, say, the mascot suit or an elf suit, where if you change the boots on it, then of course the outfit will get completely removed. And I apologise for smacking that, but um, what I said was, um, the only exception to this is like if you're wearing say like a full outfit like the elf costume and you know you change the boots then understandably the whole outfit gets removed. Now characters will also react to what Jimmy's wearing, like if Jimmy's wearing a stupid outfit people will point and laugh at you. But if Jimmy's wearing clothes from Ackleberry, 
There's a chance the preppies will notice and compliment Jimmy on his clothing style, unlike the greasers who will just make jokes about it, and vice versa. Now this attention to detail is pretty great and makes the world of Bulwer feel more alive, and you know, than the somewhat dead generic NPCs of GTA 3 or Vice City do. We can even customise Jimmy's sexuality, which is something we still haven't been able to do in any Rockstar game before or after. In the story, Jimmy is straight, with him going with near enough every single girl in school. But in free mode, the player has complete control over Jimmy's sexuality and the ability to romance boys as well. So we can make Jimmy straight, bisexual or gay, which is something that has only really been unique to Bully. As said, no other Rockstar game has let you choose the protagonist's sexuality before, and I've actually seen this being praised by LGBT gamers, and I think it's rightfully earned praise. However, the one thing with this is this particular feature isn't really mentioned at all in Bully, and you'll only really come across it by accident when greeting somebody like Trent when he just suddenly asks for flowers. Or if you actually like googling how to kiss boys and buddy because like, you know, the Xbox achievement says so, because the game doesn't actually like tell you you can do this, it's just one of those features that you come across by itself. Now the only downside to Buddy's character customization is, no matter what haircut you give Jimmy, he'll always revert back to a buzz cut if you make him wear a hat. I honestly have no idea how Rockstar managed to screw this up because in San Andreas, if CJ has a blonde afro and he wears a hat, his hair temporarily does go back to a blonde default hairstyle, which shows that CJ is still blonde underneath the hat. But in Bully, even if you give Jimmy a healthy head of pure black hair, he'll go back to a ginger buzz cut. Even if you make him bold, his hair will just suddenly come back. Now, another thing I thought was handled just a little bit poorly was the tattoo parlour. Like, tattoos in this game can just never be removed. And when I actually mentioned this previously in my 5 Ways Rockstar Ruined Bully video, yes, I'm aware that was a bit clickbaity, but still, you know, and people actually said it's just realistic like that. But that's the point, it's a game. You can remove tattoos in GTA and, and let's just be realistic here, Buddy isn't exactly, you know, a bastion for real games. So I don't really see why you can't remove tattoos in this. Also tattoos will still show if Jimmy wears a rolled up sleeve so Rockstar can somehow fix this with tattoos but not hairstyles. Feels just a little bit rushed there. But aside from that though, Buddy's character creation was handled fantastically and is nearly on par with San Andreas and GTA 9. And of course those games do have their own ups and downs. Like I said, with GTA Online, well, I didn't say GTA 9, I meant GTA 5, but you know, with GTA 9 the character customization was so much better, but yeah, GTA 9 does have that annoying default outfit issue, you know, where say if you want to wear boots with, um, you know, trousers, for some reason your character might default to wearing shorts, or if you want to wear, say, um, a specific coat over a shirt, the shirt might disappear, you get the idea. And of course, in San Andreas, there's seemingly no benefit to actually playing as a fat CJ other than for a quick laugh, but Buddy is definitely up there with some great customization for Jimmy. Now, Buddy has more of an emphasis on foot travel compared to cars, but Buddy does have its fair share of vehicles a player can use to get around the map, these being bikes, skateboards, mopeds and a go-kart. Now, the go-kart isn't unlockable, while bikes and mopeds can either be bought or stolen or unlocked through shop class. And the player gets a skateboard after beating Defend Buggy in Chapter 1. Now, bikes and Buddy come in a surprisingly wide range and have their own stats and handling. Like, for example, the racer bike is definitely the fastest bike in the game, but it handles a bit like crap especially in chapter 3, while the bike you will knock through shop 4 is the best bike in the game for high air. Now for the most part, bikes are handled well, but each and every bike is different in handling and appearance. It sort of makes you look around for the best bike to steal, you know, a bit like how in GTA you tend to look around for the best car to steal. Now Buddy also does bring the garage feature from the GTA games, but it works a lot differently here. Instead of just storing whatever bikes you stole, you can only store two legally acquired bikes. Even then, one slot is always used for a bike you can buy from shop, and the other is just, well, a reward from shop class. Now every area except Blue Skies has this garage, marked by a red gate, and they're all shared, so if you buy a racer and say Ball of Town, it'll be in Jimmy's new Coventry garage. It's an alright feature I guess, but I'd say it's a little bit overpowered in the sense that losing or destroying your bike gives you no penalty. But you can throw your bike in water, run back to the garage, and it's there good as new. It's sort of like how the main personal vehicle system in GTA 5 single player works, where say if you destroy Michael's tailgater, somehow it's back at his house without any penalty to you. Now one major criticism I do have with the bikes is you don't really see all of them in free mode. Like pretty much all the bikes you will knock through shop aren't ever seen in free mode. You might very rarely come across the bike from shop 4, but you'll never see the bikes from like shop 3 and 5 in free mode, being driven by like preps or greasers etc. Not driven you know what I mean. Now what makes them a bit useless is, once you've beaten the respective shop class, that's it, you can never really see the bugs again. It's just like a bit of a waste. Now the skateboard you get after beating Defend Bucky is quite weird because it doesn't really do anything other than give you a bit of extra speed. Like you can't do any tricks, you can't ever bail. Like I'm not expecting Tony Hawk level of gameplay here, but it just feels weird. 
The skateboard is like... I don't know, I'd probably compare it to like the bikes from Pokemon. Or at least Pokemon Platinum was actually the only one I really played, aside from Pokemon Sun. Anyway, I'm just remembering that like, you know, the bikes would give you good speed and you can exploit hills with it, but that's all it really does. And I kind of wish Rockstar added in a similar system like to the bikes, but for the skateboards if you know what I mean. Where if say like Jimmy lands facing sideways, he'll fall off and lose some health or something. But, in fairness, what the skateboard does, it does well. Like if you use it in winter, you will slide all over the place and the skateboard becomes harder to control. So, it feels like there was actually something planned more for the skateboard, but nothing ever really came of it. Now this is actually further backed up by Bunny Mod at Deadpool XYZ, who found scrapped BMX tricks that do exist in the game's files, but they all go completely unused. It kind of makes me wonder if Rockstar were planning for like some like BMX or skateboard tricks. You know, maybe not like the Tony Hawk series, but maybe for something like the player to just mess around with in free mode, but just cut them entirely. Now the gold kart is probably the last vehicle in the game the player will unlock, and it's a secret unlockable obtained by beating every single kart race in the game. And aside from the wacky physics, I'd say the kart is a fantastic reward. It's an insanely quick vehicle that handles really well, and you don't really unlock it too early so you can't really make missions any more easier than you normally would. It's probably the best reward Buddy has to offer. But the one thing I do hate about Buddy's controls is the moped. I feel that's incredibly stiff to control when going at full speed. Like, at normal speed, it's fine, but when you're mashing the sprint button, it becomes so stiff you can't even turn properly. So, how do the controls work? After all, wank controls means a wank game. Well, thankfully, Buddy's controls are handled exceptionally well on most platforms. I said most, and I'll get onto why later, but Buddy actually puts every single button to use on the PlayStation and Xbox controllers. Nothing goes unused, and they're handled that well they're also appealing to non-gamers too. There's no worries about stuff like, say, mash square three times, then press circle, then press X twice, and then press triangle, and, and you know, that kind of stuff. The way Buddy handles its tutorials is really well done too, like you're given on-screen prompts which light up and play sounds when you're doing them right. Now, everything about Buddy's controls are nearly perfect. Like, nearly nothing feels clunky, light or unresponsive when running, fighting, swimming, or riding a bike, etc. They're handled impressively well for a 2006 game. Now, when it does come to the other ports, Buddy's controls actually surprise me most on the Wii, but their controls are handled amazingly on that platform as Rockstar used the motion controls to their full advantage instead of just being gimmicky. Like, on PlayStation, you use Square to punch. On Wii, you actually swing the Wii Motor Nunchuck to punch left and right. If you want to wedgie somebody, you have to actually do a wedgie-like motion with a Wii Motor Nunchuck. If you want to aim your slingshot, you have to use your sensor bar. Rockstar didn't remove or simplify any controls to get Buddy working on the Wii, and it's really great. Now for Anniversary Edition, I sort of already covered this in my Buddy Anniversary Edition review, so I'll quickly replay what I had to say about that. Now for the controls, I can say with great confidence that the mobile controls have been handled incredibly well. For a game that was originally a PS2 exclusive and had a lot of combos on controller, it's been handled incredibly well. A few changes that have had to be made however, like Jimmy's speed is now based on how your thumb is on the movement stick, and in fights Jimmy automatically locks on to whoever's attacking him. Now as somebody who's used to playing console and PC games, I'll admit the controls threw me off a lot when I first started it up, but I got used to them fairly quickly. Now if you have a smaller phone model, or large hands, you might find the controls a bit hard to use. Now as mentioned, I have an iPhone SE, so I noticed a few times my thumb was stretched a bit too far out so Jimmy wouldn't move or he slowed down quite a bit. Now please note that isn't a fault with the game itself, the controls are incredibly responsive. I do think that comes down to your phone size mostly, like if you play this on an iPhone 8 or newer, or the Android equivalent of it, you probably won't have any issues with that at all. Now luckily, if you're a left handed player, there's a setting for you here too, it swaps the controls around, so the movement stick is now moved by your left thumb, and the other stuff like fighting and interacting and all that is now controlled by your right. Now the worst controls for Buddy definitely comes to the PC version, I absolutely despise the controls for the keyboard and mouse. Like those controls certainly do feel half assed when compared to Rockstar's other PC games. The controls are poor and it's a damn good thing Buddy on PC supports a controller otherwise I genuinely do not think I could stand the PC version at all. The mapping on them is just so awkward and it definitely puts Buddy under that play with a controller label. However, I do feel that Buddy is an incredibly easy game, which does make it more accessible and more enjoyable to casual gamers. There's no real skill bar to play, and while this might be a bit of a bad thing to more hardcore gamers who enjoy a challenge, I think it's a good thing to newer and more casual gamers. I've noticed this myself as quite a few people who like Buddy aren't into gaming at all. And no, I'm not saying that everybody who likes Buddy is a filthy casual, but I mean it definitely appeals to more laid back and casual gamers than some other games do. Now I feel the game becomes incredibly easy as it goes on, like especially when you're in chapter 4 as you obtain the spud gun, and this gun can knock out most people with a single shot. I feel something like this really makes the game insanely easy and you don't have to stand far back to take people down either. 
I think because of this, the weapons actually do make Buddy incredibly easy to play, which I think should have been a bit more balanced, like maybe up in the health for most of the characters so you can't just wipe them out in two seconds. Now, another way Buddy is an incredibly easy game is with the authorities. For example, in Grand Theft Auto, there's more of an emphasis on survival and holding your own against endless waves of police which gradually get harder and harder with swap bands and the military turning up to deal with you. Eventually, you will die. Or, you know, you can outrun them by getting police bribes or escaping their line of sight depending on what era game you're playing. But Buddy approaches this much more differently. Like, rather than focusing on holding your ground against authority, you have to run, as far as you possibly can to outrun them. Or they'll just try and detain you. If Jimmy does outrun them from a certain time, they'll just give up. It's not like Grand Theft Auto where they won't stop until you're dead, or arrested, or whenever you pick up the bribes or whatever. I actually think that Buddy's idea of escaping the authorities rather than fighting them was the base for future Rockstar titles, where unlike previous GTA games, in GTA 4, Red Dead Redemption, and even GTA 5, you can escape the authorities by doing the same thing. You know, just escaping the line of sight and just remaining hidden. However, in those games, obviously it's a bit more harder than it is in Buddy, but I definitely think Rockstar improvised off this. Now, if the authority grab you, all you have to do is mash a button, like about five times or so, and then you're free. Now, the only exception to this is the full trouble meter, which is probably akin to two stars in Grand Theft Auto, where if you get grabbed, you're instantly busted. Now, once again, this is much more different than Grand Theft Auto, where typically, if the police arrest you, it's game over instantly. Now, once again, I do think this was improvised for future titles, where, say, in GTA 4, if the police come and arrest you, you can quickly stop that and turn it into a gunfight. Now, going back to Bully, I do think all of the authorities do feel the same, but the police do not feel any more threatening than the prefects, which is a bit of a bad thing in my opinion. Like, I feel the police should have been the most threatening bunch. The only thing the police do differently compared to the prefects and the asylum orderlies is occasionally spawn on a bike, or a single car. That's about it. It kind of feels like Rockstar didn't actually know what to do with them, because obviously GTA's police do not integrate well into a game like Bully at all, but at the same time, what else could they do? Now, if I had the choice to improve this, I would ditch the trouble meter for something a bit similar to GTA's formula, but obviously make some changes here and there. Like, make it so, if you get into trouble at school, prefects chase you at lower levels, but at higher levels, the teachers will come out, which would probably put them to more use rather than just rarely spawning across the map. But if you get full meter, then the police are called in, and instead of just being a prefect reskin, make it so the police are faster, have much more health, and can actually hurt Jimmy or try to stun him or slow him down somehow. And no, I don't just mean the spud gun either, but something that makes you stumble or stop for a second. Make it so more of them chase you on foot and buy police cars and bikes. And maybe make it so the trouble meter's depletion depends on what level the player is at. Like, say, at lower levels, it should disappear after like 20 seconds, but at full, it should stay active for a good few minutes. I feel that would make the authority chases a bit more fun. Now, I think Buddy's difficulty becomes more and more non-existent as the game goes on. Like, if you do play Buddy for the first time, you might find it a bit difficult, but by the end, you will be a master. Now, whether this is a good thing definitely comes down to you, but personally, I do wish it was a bit more difficult in some areas. Now, the game also follows the traditional Rockstar formula, as at the very beginning of the game, you're very restricted in what you can do, and you only really have the core basics to play with, and a very small portion of the map. But, the game opens up more and more as you progress. Like, Chapter 1 spends the first half teaching you how to play, with missions being dedicated to specific things, like Welcome to Borth deals with moving and fighting. This is your school teaches you all about social menus and timetables. Save Algae has your first escort mission with a timer, etc. Now, as Chapter 1 progresses, it does leave you on your own towards the end. I'd probably say it's around Defend Bucky to that, I'd say, because that's sort of like when the tutorials do stop. Now, I really do like this approach as it doesn't really hold your hand that much. There are a few missions outside the first chapter which do act as tutorials, with the worst example being tagging in Chapter 3, which is basically just one massive tutorial mission teaching us how to use graffiti cans. That's it. This is probably one of the weirder missions as it's like, you know, just basically spray five tags and that's it, and this is never really used again outside of like two other missions, you know, making a mark and discretion assured. But yeah, aside from that though, Bully doesn't really teach you anything outside the first chapter, unless you go to like, say, gym class or you're going to give the hobo transistor. Aside from those two things, Buddy really doesn't hold your hand much. But with that being said, when I say doesn't hold your hand, I don't mean in the difficult sense like, you know, say Crash Bandicoot Insane or Dark Souls or whatever. You know, it just stops basically teaching you stuff. It's still quite an easy game, don't get me wrong. Now, another way that Buddy is really unique to me is a rather weird way that doesn't actually appeal to most people, and that is cut content. Yeah, every single game has it, and nearly every single game with mods available has a mod that aims to restore a lot of this cut content. But to me, Buddy's cut content is extremely interesting because pretty much every single aspect of the game was changed. I'm not just talking about like, you know, say, a cut mission or a cut weapon and some cut outfits and that. 
Blanc Mon bet that pretty much everything from Buddy's development was scrapped or changed in some way, and there are not a lot of games which have this level of cut content available. I know this isn't really to complain about the cut stuff, but rather wonder a lot about the original plans for it. Like Take the Missions, pretty much all of them had cut Jimmy lines where we'd either talk to himself or make a remark about what's happening. Loads of features were cut from the free mode, such as like buying music, playing darts, and even the entire section of bike races were gone. The story was much longer, spanning at least 7 chapters, among much much more. I cannot really cover everything here, but if you want to check the tape for yourself, check out the beta playlist for that. Every single thing was changed, some for the better, some for the worst. And it really interests me because Buddy's beta generally seems to be an entirely different game. People often quote Miyamoto for saying a delayed game is eventually good but a rushed game is forever bad. But the thing is, Buddy does fall into both categories. No, not the bad part, far from it, but you know what I mean, it was delayed, but it's also rushed. But let me explain, it was originally delayed by an entire year because it was supposed to be out in 2005 but pushed back to 2006. But yet at the same time it was rushed which is why it's a bit more buggy than most Rockstar games and when you dig beneath the surface it appears much more incomplete when you see all the cut and change content. Like maybe if Buddy was held back just a little bit more for a then next gen release on the PlayStation 3 and 360 we might have had a more feature packed and story rich version of Buddy which given what we had on the PlayStation 2 is already amazing as it is providing us with hours of endless entertainment. But holding it back for a next gen release honestly probably would have made Buddy the game of the generation as Rockstar wouldn't have been held back by PS2 hardware. We also see something similar with Grand Theft Auto V, how on the PS3 and 360 the game is lacking, when compared to the pre-release trailers, and even the current gen versions, you can just tell they were heavily restricted by outdated hardware. And you can sort of see this by like just even looking at GTA V's first trailer back in 2011 where like Mount Chiliad had a load more trees, and even just like looking at the online updates that have come since like the current gen version. Where like on PS3 and 360 all GTA got was like, you know, some themed clothes and, you know, a couple of cars and that's it. Compared to like current gen which got like, you know, entirely new apartments, new game modes, entirely new vehicles which change the way of playing. Good or bad up to you but anyway let's get back to the point. The only other two games which I know of that have had the same level of beta knowledge, if you know what I mean by that, are Dead Rising 1 and Crash to Insanity, as both of those games had absolutely massive overhauls during their development to the point they are nearly entirely different games compared to what we got, only really having the same core gameplay from the final builds, and in the case of Dead Rising gameplay even exists from E3 2005 builds thanks to Stiffo 360 somehow acquiring these builds, and even the developer from Traveller's Tales uploading 2003 footage from Crash to Insanity. Yes, I'm not getting slightly off topic here, but I really do hope that one day a beta build of Buddy from the PS2, or better yet, the original Xbox services. I'd really love to see just how much different Buddy was before Rockstar changed it. Like, would it be as violent as the game files imply? Now, I did mention this in my Scholarship Edition part of the review, but most of the Scholarship Edition stuff was actually cut content from the PS2, thanks to leftover files or even pre-release trailers, which barely any of it makes sense in the game either. Like, here there's a little side story with Jimmy and Clint somehow doing crime, but... There's only two of these missions which are out of order, and the more you look at it, the more evidence there was that there was a lot more stuff planned. Now thankfully, Buddy is one of those Rush games that was actually pretty damn amazing despite being held back so much, and I really applaud Rockstar for managing to make Buddy an absolutely fantastic game. Like looking at all these changes and all the cut stuff, in a way I do consider it really lucky for Rockstar to have not screwed this up. Because we've all heard horror stories from Rush games that were just hyped up and ended up being something god awful because they shoved it at the door to meet a deadline. Now people have also noticed that since Buddy, funnily enough, Rockstar have delayed all their main games. Now whether this is due to Rockstar trying to cash in on hype or actual development troubles, or maybe even setting an ambitious deadline, it's up to you, but I honestly respect the fact that Buddy did have genuine development troubles and Rockstar acknowledged it. Now I know I just said about Buddy's beta being different, but what if Buddy wasn't delayed and did come out in 2005 rather than being pushed back? Would it have been a lot different, or would it have ended up like Spyro the Dragonfly or Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5? You know, would it lack a lot of the charm that the final game we got? Or even maybe some of the people who love Buddy today might not even like the original as much. It's really hard to say, but at the end of the day, I think I'd rather have the Buddy we got now than an entirely different Buddy that was like buggy as all hell. I still would love to see the beta version pop up at least sometime in the future. In today's gaming age, remasters of older games aren't unheard of, but in Rockstar Games' case, Buddy was one of the first games they remastered to bring Buddy from the PlayStation 2 to the then newer generation of consoles, which at the time was the Nintendo Wii, Xbox 360, and of course PC, but that isn't a console. And they marketed this under enhanced graphics and some fresh new content which was not seen on the PlayStation 2 version of the game. Now, Buddy as a whole is often regarded as a fantastic game, 
with a surprisingly large fanbase for a game that hasn't had a sequel for nearly 13 years, and is often regarded as a real classic when bought up when discussing classic PlayStation 2 games, and it's all rightfully earned praise. However, the remastered named Scholarship Edition is actually one of the worst remasters that I've ever seen. Despite being a more enhanced version, the game was a massive step down compared to the original, which was then the last generation versions. Now typically, with remakes or remasters, they're usually more updated versions of the game which fix issues that plague the originals and add some new features which can really make a game feel new in some ways. However, when Rockstar released Bully Scholarship Edition, they did the exact opposite and caused a lot more issues than was needed. Now, some of the issues that plagued Bully Scholarship Edition upon its launch were game breaking for many players on the PC and Xbox 360 versions. For example, if you played the PC version and your PC had more than 2GB of RAM, the game would experience memory leaks where the world would load in and quickly deload, and if you turned the camera around, the entire world would despawn. And when you spoke to Dr. Kravelsnitch, you know, halfway through the first mission, the entire game would go into an endless loading loop. Now, as this was the first mission of the game, you can kind of see why many PC gamers were annoyed because they paid money for a brand new game they couldn't even play. And as any PC gamer knows, your system needs to be excessive so you can actually play the newest games anyway. So, as expected, many of these gamers had over 2 gigs of RAM. Now, on the Xbox 360 versions of the game, it would just randomly crash or drop frames randomly. Like, you could just be playing the game normally, then, you know, it cuts to a black screen, and it just crashes there and then. Or the game would just go down to about 10 FPS and then back to 30, maybe back down to 18, then back to 30 again, and then maybe another crash. But you know what the best thing about this is? Rockstar actually claimed that the issue was only on older Xbox 360 models and they didn't even bother testing Bully on the older consoles. Like with PC gaming it's a bit more forgivable because everybody's setup is different. But with consoles there's only usually a small amount of models with the same specs. Now that is actually quite lazy. Now thankfully, Rockstar did release a patch for Buddy on PC and Xbox, but that didn't solve everything. Like performance was still very dodgy on Xbox and PC regardless of setup. Now thankfully, Buddy Scholarship Edition wasn't as terrible as Saints Row 2 or GTA 4's PC launch, but it still was pretty awful. Now past a single patch, Rockstar have never bothered updating Buddy themselves, so the crashing issue on PC was brought up once again following the release of Microsoft Windows 10, where no matter your setup, Buddy would always crash. With or without mods, clean install or not, low end or high end, the game would crash after about 5 to 20 minutes gameplay. Now, of course, I would have given Rockstar the benefit of the doubt here, as future OS compatibility can never be truly guaranteed. But the thing is, as said, they never actually bothered updating Bully past the original patch. Like GTA 4 got an update on its 10th anniversary to make it more compatible with Windows 8 and Windows 10, among other fixes, you know, like fixing some missions that are more compatible with 60 FPS, and of course, you know, removing some of GTA 4's most iconic songs. But Buddy was just forgotten about and had to be manually fixed by Silent, a modder who's made other fixes for other Rockstar games on PC. Now, as a PC gamer myself, and I'm pretty sure any PC gamer watching can agree, this is probably one of the worst things a game developer can do, because, you know, people buy games to entertain themselves, not have a headache to find out they can't actually play the game. And I'm pretty sure we've all refunded games ourselves because of issues like that. For example, I've refunded games like Bioshock before because I bought it and it didn't have any sound. Anyway, I can imagine so many people have refunded copies of Buddy just because Windows 10 would not work with it. It's just annoying and it shows how neglected Buddy is and this definitely has hurt Buddy's reputation on PC and has kept many people away, especially when people ask about getting Buddy on PC. Now, that's not all of the issues. Even though I've been bitching about this for like, what, the past two minutes, this is not all of the issues. Some of the audio files in the game were actually really screwed up and were either ear rape or insanely low quality. The best example of these are Pinky's line in Carnival Date and the Candidate theme. Now don't worry, you won't need to turn your volume down much. Oh cool! Thanks Jimmy! It's so cute! Thanks for a great date Jimmy. Oh cool! Thanks Jimmy! It's so cute! Thanks for a great date Jimmy. Scholarship Edition case, Rockstar advertised new missions and classes. However, most of this content was just cut content from the PlayStation 2 version of the game, insanely basic stuff, and completely buggy as all hell. So let's go over one of the major changes that Scholarship Edition bought. At the beginning of Chapter 3, we see our first change, as we have a new side story involving Jimmy and a drunken Santa, and this lasts about 4 or so missions, which is, you know, fair enough, not too long, not too short. Now, all four of these missions are without a doubt the worst missions I've ever played. 
For example, Balls of Snow, the first mission in Chapter 3 instead of Jealous Johnny, has Jimmy doing another candidate style mission. Except without the threat, challenge or the fun of it. Like for example, in the candidate you have to protect Ernest, however despite the main mission cutscene implying Jimmy would defend this homeless alcoholic against townies, this just doesn't happen. They just walk up and down, up and down, up and down. They don't actually do anything, and there's no actual way to really fail the mission other than, well, just to hit somebody else who isn't a kid. Also, this mission actually has a chance to softlock your game, at least temporarily. For example, if one of the NPCs bugs out and throws a snowball at you, and it hits you, Jimmy will sort of just freeze in place. You can only just rotate, but you can't throw any more those snowballs. Now, if this happens, you can either just wait for the timer to run out, where you can regain control of Jimmy, or you can just like completely reload the save game. Now the second mission, Miracle on Baldwell Street, can actually be beaten in less than 30 seconds as you can skip all of the objectives in the mission. I'm not even joking, I'll even do a full playthrough of this mission right now and time it. And no, I'm not a speedrunner and I never will be. And what would you like from Santa come this on, year? Come on, come on, step right up, get your picture taken with Santa Claus. Come on, kitty, tell him what you want for Christmas. <laughs> And Nutcracking is just an extended version of music class, which I'll get onto later. Anyway, this is just about 3 minutes worth of Christmas carols and without doubt the easiest thing ever and, you, and you'll probably pass this mission by the time you're halfway through the second song. Now thankfully this one doesn't have any game breaking issues or crashes or anything like that, it's just really tedious and really easy. And the final mission, of course, is Rudy the Red Nosed Santa, which is actually the most stable of the bunch, excluding, well, Nutcracking. Which is actually saying something because there's actually a chance for Rudy, or the kids in the mission, to slide in the air, or down the toilet, or something like that. And not to mention, once his Santa story is done, you realise it was the absolute definition of filler, because the game suddenly goes back to the Greaser story, and nobody ever mentions this again. Now, I won't repeat my character critique on this, but basically, I hate this edition. It's just so forced and it's nothing more than filler. Like at the beginning, Jimmy gets asked by Peanut to help Johnny Vincent, but then that entire story is thrown aside for this crap storyline that should have only been a side mission, preferably for Christmas. You know, like how the big prank was only available on Halloween. I also personally don't like forced holidays in games too much, unless it's like short or it's relevant to the story somehow, because I feel forced holidays feel terrible at a season and doing Christmas carols in June is just that. Like, as a Brit, it's just so out of place hearing jingle bells and all that when, you know, the sun is scorching hot outside. I know for any Australians watching, that's normal. I'll admit towards Christmas the stuff is a bit more bearable. But let's be real, there's only a very tiny amount of players who conveniently got to the Christmas stuff in December. And I didn't mind Christmas in the original game much because it was just a case of go to the office, pick up a new shirt. That was it. You know, you weren't forced to just, like, babysit this Santa homeless guy person, whatever it is, you know? It's just a case of get up, Jimmy Hopkins, come to the office, blah blah blah, pick up your present, done, that was it, back to the main story. You know, it wasn't overstaying its welcome, could be done in less than 20 seconds, if that. And no, I don't mind it in modern games either, you know, like, say, Christmas in GTA 9 or St. Patrick's Day in Call of Duty, because those themes are a temporary nice change and they usually don't overstay their welcome, usually disappear in a week or so after that specific holiday ends. So, let's cover the rest of the Scholarship Edition missions, because all of these are just equally as terrible, broken and bad. Now the next Scholarship Edition mission we're going to take a look at is The Collector. Now a brief snippet of this mission's cutscene appeared in the Christmas trailer for the PlayStation 2 version of the game, which in a weirdly funny way came out about two months after the original PlayStation 2 release, but this mission only appeared in Scholarship Edition. Now in Buddy Scholarship Edition, this mission is found in Blue Skies, but the entire cutscene takes place in New Coventry, much like the Christmas trailer does. And then it starts off in Blue Skies again. Now this mission doesn't even have any mission specific music either and the entire mission is just grab a bike and go back, it's just flat out garbage. Now another bit of cut content from the PlayStation 2 version of the game is the mission Discrete Deliveries, which also made an appearance during Buddy's third PlayStation 2 trailer. Anyway, this has Jimmy delivering stuff for Dr. Watts, however this mission is insanely buggy. Like once you meet Donald, he is invincible, and no, I don't mean attack him and you'll fail type, I mean full on invincible, nobody can hit him. Okay, that's a bit weird, but once you deliver the product to someone, your camera completely glitches out and it will just stay locked onto them. And once again, no mission specific music at all. Now, between this mission and the collector, they actually do feel like test missions to make sure that storing bikes and delivering stuff works. Now, you know how Jimmy can smash up gnomes around the map? Well, in a very, very cheeky move, which I do consider false advertising, Scholarship Edition made this into a mission. Sort of. Allow me to explain. 
In Chapter 2 you can start a mission called Small Offences, where a midget is offended at the gnomes. Fair enough, it does give us a bit of a reason to why Jimmy's vandalising people's property. But the thing with this is, there's no mission at all you see, it's just a cutscene. There's something that already existed in the PlayStation 2 version of the game, and stuff that's already unlocked from Chapter 1. And even if you smash all the garden gnomes, there's no actual closure to this mission. So Rockstar actually had the nerve to market this one minute cutscene as a bonus mission for Scholarship Edition. I genuinely feel that's dodgy as hell and borderline false advertising, if not completely false advertising, you know? So on the back of the cover, Rockstar also advertised that there are four new characters, which, you know, does sound great. Do we actually get some new storylines with these people? Or new click? Well, no. The four characters that are advertised here are not even big characters and five of them are just completely irrelevant. The four exclusive characters are Rudy, Miss Peters, Mr Matthews and I have no fucking idea who the fourth is supposed to be. Is it supposed to be the elves? Or Santa? Now these characters don't even have names and it's worth mentioning that even if you do include the elves and Santa, that makes six new characters, not four. Because you know, there's two elves. And that's why I said five earlier. I don't even know where they got the four from. Maybe Rockstar themselves realised Santa and the elves weren't relevant at all. Anyway, as much as I hate Rudy the Bum Santa, he's probably the only character worth advertising for his addition to the story, as much as I don't like it. Now, aside from Rudy, all of these characters were near enough dead. Miss Peters and Mr Matthews are only here for the Scholarship Edition exclusive classes, while the elves only appear in two missions, and Santa only appears in one. Oh, also, before I forget, you know how Rockstar advertise enhanced graphics? Well, this is true, for PC and Xbox 360. If you bought this on the Wii, you basically had the PS2 graphics, just with some better shadows. I don't even know if that qualifies as enhanced graphics or not, but I do think that is damn pushing it like that gnome cutscene as a mission. Now onto the more positive side, the classes are a very welcomed addition and they do feel more complete and fleshed out more. Our scholarship edition exclusive classes are biology, music, geography and math, and each have their own unique minigames. Like geography class is where you have to guess which flag goes where, and music you have to stay in beat. Biology is a race against time to dissect an animal, and math is just quick fire math questions. Now these were great for the most part, as they fit into the game seamlessly and do offer something new. But aside from geography, all the class rewards do feel rushed. In the original classes, you get rewards that benefit you and how you play, like better socialising skills, more health from kissing, etc. But the new classes, minus geography I'll get into why in a minute, only give you exclusive but useless clothes to wear. There's actually no benefit to completing these classes or wearing the outfits. Now Geography Class did take this in the right direction as completing them gave you hood icons for collectibles around the map. The stuff like rubber bands, G&G cards and gnomes. Now this is rewarding because it makes finding the damn rubber bands 10 times easier, like you don't have to look up buddy or rubber band locations online because you already do have the locations on your map completely offline. You still get clothes but these rewards give you a reason to attend Geography and beat the class because it makes the hidden Rockstar collectible stuff much less tedious. I personally think Geography Class surpasses all the others because of the reward to difficulty ratio. Like I'll admit I struggled in 2009 when I had no internet so beating this was damn relieving to see the gnomes marked on my map. Now Scholarship Edition, or at least Wii and the Xbox version of the game, also bought multiplayer. However this was not online or even local co-op like GTA San Andreas on the PS2 had. Instead it's just generic class minigames with Jimmy and Gary. And most of these are already minigames that are available in single player, but thankfully they're changing enough so you're not just replaying English free with a friend. Now while a bit disappointing, I'll admit that I love the alien easter egg that's only visible in the co-op biology class which is a somewhat rare spawn. I can't help but feel that this is Rockstar's way of mocking the myth hunters from GTA and Buddy who believe that aliens and UFOs could be found around Los Santos and Bullworth. Anyway, one of the few things you can compare Buddy and GTA 5 on is how they were both remastered for the next generation of consoles, as they were both released towards the end of their original respective console life. However, thankfully Rockstar handled GTA 5 on Xbox One and PS4 fantastically and it does show. Like, I'm going to compare them both, but only how their remasters are handled, as they're both completely different games in their own ways to actually be compared, if you know what I mean. Anyway, GTA 5's next gen ports added quite a lot of small, but definitely great features. For example, there's much more traffic around Los Santos. All of the DLC cars from the 316 PS3, well, the ones that were released up until next gen came out, were added as street cars. There were more songs on the radio, there's first person mode, and a bonus mini mission for Michael and a murder mystery as well as actually patching a lot of glitches around the map, such as wall breaches that were exploited a lot in GTA Online at the time. Now I'm not saying that Bully needed all of this stuff, especially as Bully was originally a 2006 game, but considering that Rockstar took advantage of the PS4 and Xbox One's hardware to make GTA 5 more fleshed out, more patched up and a bit more feature rich, they could have done the same with Bully. It's honestly a massive shame they didn't spend more time on developing it for the Xbox 360 and PC, so Bully could take advantage of the, then, more powerful hardware which actually held Bully back a lot on the PlayStation 2. 
Now overall, I do feel that Rockstar were looking for anything to shove into scholarship edition to market it as new content, and I just went with cut content from the PlayStation 2, which, actually speaking of, I'll save the best for last. Now many of us are very familiar with cut content for games, as after all, every game has it, and they're usually found by data mining the game's files, and of course Buddy is no exception. However, the PC ports of Buddy, Rockstar actually left in a lot of beta files from development. I'm not just talking about a few skins, on character or a weapon or whatever, I'm talking about nearly everything from the PlayStation 2's development. Now this might sound like a shameless plug, but check up any of my beta videos or anybody else's. There's so much cut content in this game you can actually get the gist of what Rockstar were planning originally. But at the same time, this stuff is so messy and so chopped up it's borderline impossible to restore any of it. It genuinely feels like Rockstar used an early PS2 builder bully to work from for scholarship. Maybe they were originally planning on giving Jimmy half of his unused voice lines back, or finding some ways to add in the deleted features from the PS2. Or maybe Rockstar just rushed it out of the door for release, not really caring about the completely unused files that don't add anything other than pad out the game size. Also, nearly all of the spider stuff on the PC and Xbox versions isn't seen anywhere on the original PS2 disc, and that could be more proof that this version was rushed out the door to meet a release date. Now, in closing, Scholarship Edition is about to date one of the poorest excuses of a remaster to an otherwise absolutely legendary game. Rockstar could have done so much more with it to actually make it even better than the original version, like fixing some of the bugs or introducing some missions which tie into stories on the PS2 a bit better. You know, like the whole Ted vs. Ernie selection, a bit more story between Johnny and Lola, or handling the townies a lot better in Chapter 5, etc. Now, I do think it's incredibly lucky that Bully Scholarship Edition is the only version that's available on Wii, PC and Xbox, as if it was a separate edition of the game, you know like how games nowadays have standard and deluxe editions and all that, I can honestly see a lot more people getting really annoyed after realising they wasted an extra 15 quid on something that's very, very basic at best. I'll only be covering the main story for the most part, but I'll start off by going over how Bully handled the story compared to other Rockstar games first. Now, one of the ways Bully handles its story is it's broken up into six chapters, all taking place in different seasons. Compared to the Grand Theft Auto series, which seems to be one long story with very little breaks in between. Now, depending on how you like your stories, this may be a good or a bad thing. Like, Grand Theft Auto is much more streamlined in its approach. Like how GTA V manages to seamlessly transition Michael's relationship issues with his wife into a debt storyline, which then also transitions into Trevor hunting Michael down after the heist. Now, in Buddy, the approach is much more broken up. Like, Chapter 3 is set in winter, dealing with one storyline, you know, Johnny Vincent and his girlfriend but then skips ahead a few months into spring and jumps straight into another storyline with Ted Thompson, the jock leader instead, and a completely different storyline that is not related to Chapter 3. However, chapters are the one thing that separates Buddy and GTA's sphere of progression. Like I said, Grand Theft Auto seems to take place over the course of like a single month or so, and aside from minor map changes, there's rarely anything major like season changes, which is how Buddy handles its transitions. Like when you look over the stories of Grand Theft Auto, you can kind of tell when a chapter begins and ends. Like at the first chapter of San Andreas is all about CJ returning home to impress Sweet and show his worth to the grocery families, but then abruptly ends when CJ is kidnapped by Crash, beginning the Exile from Los Santos kind of storyline. Well, in my opinion, Buddy's storyline gives me a proper feeling of storyline progression, with the game beginning in autumn and slowly progressing to summer as the story goes on, with the game even celebrating some holidays being given their own little side missions instead, and the map being decorated with Christmas and Halloween stuff. Now this is a really nice touch as Rockstar don't really celebrate holidays in their games. Well, they do in GTA Online and Red Dead Online, but not their story mode game. Buddy is the only Rockstar game to celebrate this to my knowledge, as we haven't seen any like celebrations in GTA 5 or Red Dead Redemption 2, or any of the other older Grand Theft Autos. Also, unlike some other older games, you know like Simpsons Hit and Run or Animal Crossing, which rely on the system clock to celebrate holiday, Buddy's holidays are mandatory parts of the story which, as I said in a previous video, can be hit or miss depending on when you play. Like for example, the Scholarship Edition exclusive Rudy storyline, you know, the bum Santa, is very unfitting when you play in summer. Now pretty much all the Buddy storyline is incredibly light-hearted and fits in jokes here and there in most cutscenes. Now once again, this is a much more different approach from Grand Theft Auto, which has a good mix of both funny, serious and emotional cutscenes. Like in GTA San Andreas, where CJ gets to the garage from Claude, and he goes on a rant about calling him all kinds of names. Now that's a funny cutscene, but earlier on in the story it had an emotional moment where CJ realised his childhood friends betrayed him. Now Bully doesn't have many serious moments like this and I think it keeps a very consistent theme throughout most chapters, and keeps the same pace rather than switching up here and there. Now I'd say most of the serious cutscenes in the game, like when Jimmy gets expelled, and the final showdown missions. So if you love the gritty drama of Red Dead Redemption 1 or Red Dead Redemption 2, Bully's storyline might not appeal to you because it's much more comedic, light-hearted, 
Now, one of the things that Buddy has as well are side missions, which are usually their own little side stories which don't clog the main story on the filler, nor do they interfere with it. You can do them in the middle of chapter 3, you can do them in the middle of chapter 4, after the entire storyline's beaten. Well, obviously, once you unlock the missions, of course, you know, you can't just start off chapter 1 and do, say, um, Edna's storyline, for example. Now, a good example of this is the Hattrick vs Galloway storyline. With the exception of being one of the first missions of chapter 2, this storyline doesn't add or take anything away to Jimmy's story, but instead expands upon three minor character storylines instead. And even then, it's not just a single mission, it's a series of missions which have breaks in between. Well, if you do them when they become available, that is. Which I think is great, since it doesn't shove the entire story down our throat at once and also gives a bit of character development to characters who don't have a role in the story much. Now, I also think this may have helped pave the way for future Rockstar games that had side missions, like Strangers and Freaks in GTA 4 and 5, and the various side missions in the Red Dead series, where those missions would follow a similar structure. You know, you could start them when they become available, but you could also do them after you've beaten the main game, or you could just, like, do them as soon as they become available, that kind of stuff. But enough about the side missions, let's get on to reviewing the main story with Chapter 1. Anyway, the first chapter focuses on Jimmy's arrival at Borth Academy and how he's adapting to his new life, alongside trying to meet new people and make some new friends, as well as being the victim of bullies for being the new kid. Now, our story begins with Jimmy being dropped off at the gates of Borth, going on about his mother and a new marriage. Now, what makes this a bit weird is how, unlike previous and future Rockstar games, the actual intro with Jimmy and his parents is the skippable credits cutscene that will play every time you boot the game up. So there's a chance many players may have skipped over this. The intro credits thankfully don't make you miss much, as it's mostly just dealing with Jimmy's strained relationship with his parents, and it's mostly just them arguing as Jimmy arrives in Bullworth. Now this cutscene I feel is a great introduction because it sets up why Jimmy's at Bullworth, you know. It's not just a case of his parents just decide to send him there or whatever. It's because, well, as we can kind of tell, Jimmy and his family don't seem to be the best, you know. And going off Jimmy's first line of Mom, why'd you marry that phony? It indicates that Jimmy doesn't have the best relationship with his mom's new partner. And of course, if you pay attention to the entire intro credits cutscene, we learn that Jimmy's there for an entire year. So it's not just a case of, you know, Jimmy just being dumped there because his parents don't want him or anything. And of course, you know, this chapter is also where Jimmy gets taken into Bullworth by Miss Danvers. Now, in this chapter, we're introduced to some of our main characters, like Pete, Gary, Algernon, Dr. Cravelsnitch, who all seem to play some kind of role in the first chapter, some bigger than others. Now, the pace of chapter one I find to be really fitting for new player, as the game starts off really slow, and seems to get most of the tutorials out of the way in the first few missions. Like how Welcome to Borth gets our fighting and wardrobe out of the way, This Is Your School is all about interacting and how the clock works in the game, and the setup, which is like the third mission in the game, is a great early mission to put new player skills to the limit, as well as doing a great job at solidifying the bullies as our antagonists for chapter one. As we have a very basic mission, but it's also the first kind of mission which sort of throws you on your own. You do get reminders, but nothing like, you know, Davis is standing there, this is your chance. Now the next few missions of Save Algae and Slingshot do a decent enough job at introducing the player to timed missions and how to use ranged weapons. Now I'd say that most of this chapter's missions don't really do much in terms of story building per se, but rather spends more time introducing us to characters and how to play the game. A bit similar to GTA San Andreas, I'd say, where the first portion of the story is teaching us how to play and dealing with CJ Settling back in Grove Street. The only sort of story we get in here is learning how the buddies sort of like try to make life hell for the nerds and us to an extent, but also as well with Gary Smith being hell bent on his plan to take over the school. There's not really much to it as these missions are just sort of like help this person or whatever. So yeah, this chapter isn't really the strongest of story building. However, that being said, near the end, we have a mission called The Candidate. Now this mission is probably the worst mission for story content, because in The Candidate, Jimmy meets Ernest Jones, the nerd leader who's running for class president, against the jock leader Ted Thompson, and pays Jimmy to defend him from public humiliation as the jocks are planning. Now this mission is a great one, as we see these posters scatter in the academy since the game began. We see their faces plastered everywhere, we know that something big is coming involved in these two. You do feel like that this will be a storyline that will somehow tie into the main story, you know with the buddies or maybe it'll come back in the future. But nothing ever comes out of this mission again, not even in chapter 4 which is all about Ted and Ernest. It just feels like a massive waste of time. So yeah, this mission doesn't even have anything to do with the buddies per se. But granted, it does introduce us to Ernest, one of the better recurring characters throughout the story, but it doesn't do anything for Jimmy's story involving the bullies or Gary's plan to take over the school or anything like that. You know, it just seems like Roxa had an idea for a story here, but they just decided to throw it all away for some reason, and all they decided to keep was just this one mission. 
Now, after the candidate, it's Halloween and we see a rather impressive change around the academy, as Jimmy, Pete and Gary decide to spend the evening playing pranks on everyone. Now, I feel this mission is another introduction mission to how pranks and errands work. Like in this mission, we have errands about sticking kick me signs on people's backs and using Volcano 4000 fireworks and all that. But I appreciate how this story gives us a bit of break from Gary's semi-serious take over the school plan and the antagonistic bullies one, to have a bit of comedy with Jimmy nearly blowing students up with Volcano fireworks. Now the outfits that Gary and Jimmy wear are very clear references, with Jimmy's being a reference to the Karate Kid, and Gary's being a reference to, um, well let's just say the Germans from 1939 to 1945, and I can't see any clear reference to Pete. Now the next morning, Jimmy finds Gary acting really weird in the lounge, where he mentions finding something amazing, and Jimmy needs to come along. Now this is a good mission for building mystery as we have no hints to what Gary's up to. After attacking three bullies for seemingly no reason, Gary lures us into the basement, and this is where we get a really good sense of mystery. Like what is Gary up to here? What's he actually found? His constant cryptic comments of you're really gonna like this don't help either. Now after getting us through the basement with Gary's snide remarks for how to progress to the next room, he lures us down a really weird sewer kind of place. Now I remember the first time I ever played this on PS2, I did not want to go down there because I felt something was really off. Like we was about to get ambushed by the buddies, with Gary's vagueness and how far in the basement we were, it builds off a massive sense of tension, distrust and mystery, and help Gary pulls that off fantastically. Starting off as, I wonder what Gary's found, at the beginning to, I don't trust this one bit towards the end. Now once you go downstairs, for some unexplained reason, all of the school kids are down here, and Gary publicly accuses Jimmy of going against him. So Gary set up a fight between Jimmy and Russell, in full view of everybody. Now I think Gary's betrayal was to be expected of how he treated Pete and everybody else he comes across in chapter 1, you know of how he abuses the homeless man, he bullies Pete, he's bullied Algernon, and all that, but I think betraying us by getting us beaten up in front of everybody is a good way to get that betrayal, and Russell in the hole is our first boss fight without the game holding our hand like previous missions. We're not told when to attack or what to do, it's purely up to us and what we learnt in the first chapter, and I think it's a decent challenge, especially if we came unprepared and you're on low health. And Russell also changes up his attacks halfway through the fight, so newer players may be caught off guard by this. Now our chapter comes to a close with Jimmy realising the fight was a waste of time with Gary berating him in front of everybody, and Jimmy and Russell make amends, which brings an end to Jimmy's beef with the buddies, a great boss fight all around, and the best way to end our chapter. In chapter 2, I feel the story was a lot more streamlined with the chapter directly carrying off fresh from Jimmy's fight with Russell and how it seamlessly transitions into Jimmy's story with the preppies, beginning with Gord offering Jimmy to come and visit their boxing gym. Now while the vast majority of this chapter is Jimmy dealing with the preps, I feel there's a sudden shift in tone as the first two missions take place on school grounds dealing with Jimmy's punishment handed to him by Dr. Cravelsnitch, and then the chapter directly gets onto the preppies. But to me, that doesn't really feel like there's a natural shift between Jimmy being punished and him deciding to drop by the preps gym for Gord's invitation. Now the missions of Preps Challenge, Race the Veil, vale, Carnival Day and Last Minute Shopping do a great job of putting the town of Borf to good use, and I would say that these missions are sort of introduction missions as to what Bordy has to offer in terms of outside story content. For example, Last Minute Shopping introduces us to stores, Preps Challenge introduces us to the boxing minigame, Race the Veil vale shows us bike racing, and Carnival Day introduces the carnival and what the player can do there. Now I really did like the approach Bordy took here as it felt rather seamless and didn't really feel forced at all. Now this chapter story is a decent one at best as it mainly focuses on Jimmy's rivalry with Tad Spencer and Gord Vendome, with constant showing up between them both. Well, technically both because Gord and Tad are friends, so yeah. Anyway, and what I mean by this is they constantly try and show each other up, with the preppies trying to publicly humiliate Jimmy, to Jimmy showing them up at a bike race, to the preps nicking Jimmy's trophy. Now our story with the preppies really begins at Preps Challenge, where after entering and winning the boxing competition, Jimmy goes to the boxing gym to hang out, so it appears Jimmy did take Gord's offer up on hanging out. However, when we get there, Gord is nowhere to be seen, instead we have somebody here called Tad Spencer. Now Tad offers to take us along to egg Mr. Hadrick's house, which is some nice continuation from the beginning story with Hadrick vs Galloway. And our only task is simply just to take some eggs to Tad's house. Simple enough. Upon arriving however, Tad confronts us about some comments that Jimmy apparently said about his family and Gary arrives from the shadows to reveal that it's him who's been talking smack about Jimmy and what he's been saying about other people's family. Now what I like about this mission is it has that classic rockstar kind of force shadow looking back you can clearly see it kind of feel as you realise Gord was never going to hang out with Jimmy, it was just a setup by the preps to egg Jimmy publicly because of Gary causing trouble. It's also with the eggs you can start to see the game up its difficulty a bit with more people attacking you at once, attackers you can't see and the game is offering no more hints for you. 
Now, after escaping Tad's yard, Jimmy returns to the dorm to see Pete watching TV by himself and wondering where everybody is. Now, Pete somehow knows Gary got the preps to egg Jimmy, and the pair have a small chat about Pete being happy he had friends for once, to which Jimmy tells him he's not alone, and basically, he is his friend, which is nice. And then Jimmy drags Pete to a bike race when Pete tells Jimmy that's where everybody, and I use that term very loosely, is. Now when we get to the race, everyone turns out to be three preppies and two girls. Anyway, this mission just serves as our introduction to races really, and there's not much to it. However, after Jimmy's victory, the next mission ties in incredibly well to this, only to have it stolen by Gordon, we go and beat up Gordon and some of his preppy friends up to get it back. Now I think this mission is where our rivalry with Jimmy and the preppy starts to boil up a lot and I think it's handled incredibly well. We have our reasons why the preps hate Jimmy, because according to them, Jimmy said stuff about their family, he's beat them all up, and then he's beat them in a race, and he's beaten them up again. So you know, we actually have some valid reasons as to why the preps hate Jimmy, and how Gary's antagonistic ways are actually working quite well. Now after this, Jimmy encounters Russell bullying the local shopkeeper for calling him dumb. And even though we can go through the entire story without ever seeing this guy, he knows us as Egg Kid. Now that could mean that Jimmy was the guy who egged that Australian senator, I don't know, maybe it could be. So who knows, we've got our Egg Kid after all. But regardless, it's a bit of inconsistency, especially if you've never been inside the old Bald Vale shop. But either way, he suggests we egg Tad's house in revenge, and Jimmy takes Russell as backup probably the most stereotypical teenage revenge mission in the entire game. Now after this, Jimmy laments with Pete about how he can beat the preps, and Pete suggests boxing Biff Taylor, one of the preppies best to show them all that he is better than them all. And we're thrown into a boxing boss battle. Now what I like about this is it's different than fighting Russell, as we only have our boxing move, so we can't deal with Biff using weapons like we probably would prefer to. Now this fight is great and all, but personally I feel it's a bit too easy, and I didn't feel the fight was any more difficult than the boxing challenge from the beginning of the chapter. Now after our victory, Jimmy is busy gloating and the preppy leader Darby Harrington comes out from the sidelines and is incredibly offended that a poor person beat up a rich person. So all the preppies decide to attack Jimmy here and now, and so begins our boss fight with Darby Harrington. Now chapter 2 had a good story and had some weight to it. However, one thing I didn't like about the story here is how underused Darby Harrington is. I would say he's like the polar opposite of Russell here, as Russell was a major antagonist throughout chapter 1, having quite a few run-ins with Jimmy, especially in the first few missions. However, Darby's first actual mission appearance, minus the click introduction one, is in his own boss fight. Now, I feel this was handled horribly as Jimmy spent the chapter rivaling with Tad and Gord mostly, Darby just seemed to show up out of nowhere at the end. Now, unlike Russell, I didn't feel there's much of a point to have Jimmy fighting somebody you've never met before. That being said, Darby's boss fight was actually great and pretty challenging when you first play because you're never instructed to block the doors, so you keep getting bombarded with preppies. But I do wish more was done with Darby's character to help build him up as an antagonist instead of just shoving him in at the last moment. Like the pinky plot could have tied in as to why Darby wants to be Jamil. Like say Darby's angry because Jimmy broke a family tradition of the Harringtons, which is also mentioned earlier, which also led to Darby's family blaming him and seeing Biff beaten, knowing what Jimmy did to Gordon Tad, pushed him over the limit. I don't know, there's some reasons for Darby to hate Jimmy I guess, as opposed to just, you beat up my rich friend, let's beat him back to the ghetto. Now for this part I'm going to gloss over the Santa storyline because I'm saving that for when I get to reviewing Scholarship Edition as part of my ultimate review in the next video. Now anyway, this chapter mostly focuses on the Greaser leader Johnny Vincent and his relationship issues, which I think is probably the most realistic chapter in the entire game. Now looking back on my school and college years, I can definitely say that Johnny's storyline isn't that unrealistic. Anyway, the first part of the chapter is all about Jimmy helping Johnny, which has a different approach to Russell and Darby as they were portrayed as antagonists, and I think I'll repeat what I said in my Johnny critique as it covers how I felt about chapter 3. Now when Jimmy travels to New Coventry, we meet Johnny for the very first time, and we learn an awful lot about Johnny in this minute long cutscene. Within the first 20 seconds, we learn Johnny is incredibly paranoid, accusing Jimmy of laughing at him behind his back, and Johnny becomes increasingly angry before quickly coming to his senses and revealing the reason why he's so angry, because of his girlfriend Lola cheating on him. Now, we actually got a very subtle hint towards the storyline in Chapter 2, in the mission Movie Tickets, where Gordon and Lola are waiting in line at the movies. It's not uncommon for Rockstar to add in foreshadows and hints in their games, though this hint wasn't so subtle when you look back on it. Now this scene is a great introduction to Johnny in my opinion, as it shows Johnny isn't like the other people we've met in the game so far, and he could be a very dangerous character. Everyone else Jimmy's met so far hasn't been as violent or as paranoid as Johnny is. Russell only attacked Jimmy in the introduction because Jimmy beat up his friend Wade, the preps only attacked Jimmy because of Gary's room spreading, but Johnny just flat out accuses Jimmy and puts hands on him in the first scene we meet him. 
After Jimmy gets the photos for Johnny, we see Johnny is understandably irritated, once again getting angry at Jimmy just for talking, and then plotting his revenge on Gord, which is to round up his friends and beat Gord up, which does succeed. After Gord's beating, Johnny has two reactions, a cheerful reaction and a slightly more angry reaction. Now in my opinion, this is another great mission to showcase how dangerous Johnny is. Unlike other clicks which usually deal with people in a one-on-one -on -one scenario, Johnny just outright sets Gord up for a beating in an abandoned park in Greaser territory where none of Gord's preppy friends can really help him. Okay, Gord was with Tad and Parker, they also got beaten up. Either way, Gord and the two preps being beaten up in this abandoned park, then being left there as Johnny, Jimmy and the Greasers leave, is a definite sign that Johnny is someone you don't want to get on the bad side of. Now personally, I think the sudden shift from helping to going against the Greasers was a bit sudden. Like, I can see why Jimmy would be helping the preppies, but the Nerds mission is probably the weirdest one in the entire chapter, as Lola was going after Chad and Algy, even though the entire chapter storyline was supposed to be about Gordon Lola. Now, I get Lola's supposed to be a slut and all that, but it's never brought up again and he could probably erase wrong part of town and this would be the exact same storyline. I get how it kind of explains how the Greasers know Jimmy is going against them, but maybe swapping at Algy for Gord, or, I don't know, even Chad for Gord, and have this mission being given by Darby, and it would have been a hell of a lot better, since it would have also tied into the preppy Greaser rivalry. Now, after helping Algy and Chad escape, we have another tutorial mission for the basic art of graffiti tagging. Halfway through the game, might I add. Now, I feel this was handled horribly, as halfway through the game we should know everything by now. Like, imagine if halfway through Red Dead Redemption 2 in Chapter 4 we only just learned how to hold tie NPCs, or if in Grand Theft Auto we only just learned how to buy your own cars. Now, in my opinion, this could have been handled in Chapter 2 with, say, I don't know, Jimmy tagging up Tad's house as revenge, alongside egging him. Now, after this mission, Lola and Johnny are having relationship issues at Lola's house, which is in the middle of the road. So either Lola is homeless, or this was a weird design choice from Rockstar, and Jimmy and Johnny have a race to prove who's better, and Lola goes as the winner. Now, one of the things I always felt was rushed was how Jimmy went from helping Johnny to being in a relationship with Lola himself, and I feel this can actually be explained by a cut mission. Where Jimmy meets Lola while looking for Johnny, and she convinces him to help look after her and Tad. Now, this mission, while cut quite early, actually does explain how Lola and Jimmy know each other. Now, I don't know why it was cut, as I think it explains why Jimmy's going after Lola as well. Instead of making Jimmy look like a backstabbing jackass to the one clip who were actually somewhat friendly with him, because in the cutscene, Lola was being really flirty with Jimmy, and you can see by the end he's somewhat fallen for it. Now, the last part of Chapter 3 is all about Jimmy and Lola's relationship, where, surprise surprise, Lola isn't popular with the Greasers anymore after kissing Jimmy, Gord, Tad, and pretty much everybody else, and she's been kicked out of the Greaser hangout. But all of her stuff is there, and the next mission after that, she dumps Jimmy, and Jimmy doesn't care. Now, the Tenements itself is a really weird mission, but the story setup is very consistent with the story to Chapter 3, but the Tenements building itself is just really weird, though the outside doesn't even match the inside, which coincidentally also has an outside portion itself. So it seems like this entire building, or at least the outside of it, was changed, and Roxxon never bothered to update it, and the Tenements is never mentioned again as the Greasers hideout. Now, after Jimmy gets Lola's items, we learn that Lola's ways have caused a massive riot between the Preppies and Greasers, and while a good story arc, it's also a bit confusing. Like the mission cutscene is Lola dumping Jimmy for not caring, yet the mission afterwards is Jimmy looking for Peanut, and once we find him, we fight three Greasers. Now, I don't get this at all. At no point is it ever explained why Jimmy is going after the Greasers, made even more confusing in the Johnny Vincent boss scene, where the Greasers Jimmy just beat up aren't the ones he beat up. I mean, like, you know, when he picks up Hal, he wasn't even present at the fight. He's also gloating about how he's the boss now, but when Johnny arrives, he tries to keep Johnny calm. Even though in the mission just, Jimmy said he was going after Johnny anyway. Now that's just really confusing if you ask me. Now while I did love the Johnny Vincent boss fight, one thing that everybody wonders is, what the hell is Pete even doing here? He's never seen in Chapter 3, aside from the intro, he wasn't present in any of the missions, and yet he turns up here and none of the greasers really seem to care. You know, I feel this part was really rushed to hell or Rockstar just wanted to shove Pete in somehow to keep his supporting character status. Now, I really did like the addition of having Lola be the real antagonist of Chapter 3 instead of Johnny, because it's the only chapter where the click leader isn't actually the bad guy for once and Lola is the only female antagonist in the entire game, alongside being the only character who never gets any consequences for her actions. She gets away with everything while Johnny, Gord, and to a small extent Jimmy, are the ones who are actually worse off for this chapter because Jimmy was played a fool of, while Lola will probably keep going with others behind Johnny's back, making him worse mentally.
Now chapter 4 seems to take place a few months after Jimmy and Johnny's fight and begins with Pete being bullied by the jocks, to which Jimmy wants to get revenge on them and goes to see Ernest by helping them take the jocks down. Now when Jimmy gets to the library, for some unexplained reason, Ernest and all the other nerds have turned on Jimmy for no reason. Stronghold Assault sees Jimmy storm the observatory to get Ernest on his side, but what was the point in this? There's no reason given to us about this and it makes even less sense as we know Ernest and Ernest knows Jimmy. The closest thing we get is Ernest assuming Jimmy is there to beat him up, but even then that makes no sense as Jimmy went to speak to Algy, not Ernest. Definitely one of the weirdest story twists and one of the most uncalled for. Now the next mission sees Ernest asking for Jimmy's help in acquiring photos of Mandy Wilde, and these photos come in the form of her cheerleading, Mandy in the shower, and Mandy shaving her legs. Now this is without a doubt the most illegal thing in the entire game, and while most people hate Ernest for doing this mission, I do think it's a good character building mission for Ernest, as it shows what a disgusting character he is. Now if you want to hear my thoughts on Ernest's character, check out my character critique video on him. Anyway, inside the library, Jimmy is tasked by Special Agent Algy to help out the nerds of the carnival, as they're sabotaging the fun house for the jocks visit. But when Jimmy gets there, the entire plan has gone to hell and the jocks are attacking the nerds. There really isn't much to this mission as Jimmy just beats up jocks and escorts nerds. Also, this mission is never mentioned again and it just feels really out of place, I feel. Now, back at the observatory, Ernest appears to be having a visit with Karma as the jocks are there ready to kill him for the naked photos of Mandy he has, and some nice continuation from that disgusting story from earlier. And Jimmy helps Ernest fend off the jocks in an incredibly fun mission which I think sets some tension between the nerds and the jocks. Also, earlier I mentioned how Ernest turned on Jimmy for no reason. Well, that's a slight lie. The jock attack was the reason why Ernest turned on Jimmy, and the reason why was because in the beta, Paparazzi was the first mission of Chapter 4, with Stronghold Assault being the second, which explains why Ernest turned on Jimmy, and why the spud cannon was broken, because Jimmy just broke it. God knows why Rockstar changed this, because it was much more consistent originally, and explains everything so much better. What a pointless and confusing change that was. Thankfully, the next two missions are very consistent, with Discretion Assured, which is the ending to Mandy's humiliation caused by Ernest, and Nice Outfit, which also carries on with Ernest's plans to take down the jocks. Now, Discretion Assured is actually one of the nicer moments in the game in my opinion, as Jimmy feels genuine remorse about his involvement in Mandy's humiliation, and tags over all the posters Ernest and the nerds have stuck up around town of her. Now, it doesn't clear Jimmy's involvement in this, as he's partly responsible, well, I'd say fully responsible in a way for not declining and willingly doing this anyway, but I think it shows one of his nicer sides. He actually feels genuine remorse for what he's done. He's caused humiliation to somebody that he feels didn't deserve it. Now this mission itself is a bit basic, but it works well for what it is. Now nice outfit is when Ernest's plan to humiliate the jocks begins and Jimmy's issued with a simple task, which is to acquire the mascot outfit, and Jimmy does this by assaulting the mascot until he gives chase, alongside multiple jocks. But then Jimmy leads the mascot to the pool to fight him in a 1v1. How there is no one in the gym is beyond me, and I wonder how Jimmy even got out of the pool as there was no way out, but I'm not complaining as this plot point was great overall. After acquiring the mascot outfit, we reach our conclusion to chapter 4, which is the big game, and this mission was definitely one of the finest ones Bully has to offer. This mission is definitely one of the funniest ones, as even the intro scene begins Jimmy catching Ernest fantasising over um, adult entertainment magazines and I should keep me monetized. And the mission itself has Jimmy pissing in drinks, nearly causing murder, and super gluing arses to benches. This mission I think is the high point of comedy for the game. Now the gameplay in this mission is drastically different as well, as rather than running around sniping jocks like we would expect to, we actually infiltrate them, we use the mascot outfit to sabotage everything. We do have to do the cow dance whenever we get spotted by them, which I'll admit can get a tad annoying, but it's forgivable for how fun and hilarious this mission can be. Also, unlike every other mission where it's like go here, do this, we can actually choose what order we do them in. Each part changes stuff up nicely, and always shows the effects of Jimmy and the nerd sabotaging. It also has some nice detail as preppies and greasers are incredibly hostile to you in this mission, as they don't know it's Jimmy. Now this kind of mission really shows Bully's potential for some highly detailed missions, which sadly doesn't happen much outside of this mission and say algae I believe. After sabotaging the jocks game, we skip forward to what I assume is half time, or the end of the game as Jimmy reveals himself to Ted and Damon, who threatened to kill him. Now, I've said my thoughts on this fight before in my Ted Thompson character critique, so I'll quickly replay that. Now, speaking of the big game, I even found the whole boss fight to be really underwhelming too. Now, I know that's kind of controversial, don't get me wrong, the build-up was amazing, the mission before it was one of the best set of missions I've ever played in any Rockstar game, the atmosphere was amazing, alongside the soundtrack, which, in my opinion, I consider to be one of the best soundtracks in all of Bully. But the payoff was just really weird and underwhelming. 
like we have Jimmy and the Jocks throwing explosive footballs at each other. And then we get to fight Ted by himself, but Ted doesn't even attempt to fight Jimmy, and he's knocked out of a single punch. I still remember when I first beat him on the PS2 back in 2008, and I just remember saying to myself, what the hell was that? When it just seemed to abruptly end. And yes, I'm aware that sack Ted means tackle, but as a Brit we don't get much American football over here, aside from the NFL Super Bowl, which I don't even watch because, you know, the sport doesn't appeal to me. Anyway, back on topic. And I didn't mention it in my Ted Thompson critique, but why is Pete here? Again, just like the Johnny fight, he had barely anything to do in this chapter, yet he's still here. This time, Pete's in an even more useless position as he doesn't even help out in the fight other than just to tell Jimmy to take Ted down. At this point, I feel like Rockstar just wanted to remind us that Pete exists as a supporting character. Honestly, it's a bit weird just to shoehorn him into missions where he doesn't do anything. Well, okay, it's a bit of a slight guy as Pete is happily celebrating with Jimmy after Ted's defeat, and I like the foreshadowing in the beginning where Jimmy says he'll kick Ted's ass publicly, and he does. Now chapter 5 seems to begin not too far from the big game. During the chapter intro with Jimmy's monologue, I always get the kind of vibe that this is the next day. Now, I don't know if that's because we were just in the pouring rain at night time and now it's a dry morning, and I think having the janitor mowing the lawn helped gives off that kind of vibe too, like he's doing some aftermatch care to the field. Anyway, our story begins with Jimmy and all the clique leaders, minus Russell, and Jimmy seems to have brought World Peace to Wolf Academy, and is incredibly, incredibly happy. I mean, we even see Darby Harrington and Johnny Vincent getting along, you know, two sworn enemies, greeting each other. It doesn't get much more peaceful than that. Now, our chapter begins with the power clearly getting to Jimmy's head as he thinks about how he can show Bullworth he's the king and has a minded discussion with his newfound friends about what to do. And despite Pete's warning about remembering about Gary, they come to the conclusion that tagging City Hall is a great way to show Jimmy's the boss, and Jimmy sets off to do so. After single handedly annoying the entire town with his offensive remark of Bullworthless, a rather good pun on Bullworth and Worthless, Jimmy returns to discover everybody's angry and they hate him, but we're not told why. Now, I think this is a good way to approach Jimmy's downfall, as we're left wondering what happened. Did everybody find Jimmy's joke that offensive? Did Gary do something while he was away? It adds a bit of tension as we see our respect of everybody except the bullies fall into dangerous levels. Now, after this, we make our way to the library to see the nerds too scared to enter, and there's a massive rat infestation and Jimmy gets blamed for it. Somehow. I really don't understand why Jimmy gets the blame here. Assuming this happened while Jimmy is vandalising City Hall, surely Ernest of all people can vouch for Jimmy not being responsible. Anyway, after clearing the library for the ungrateful nerds, it's discovered the rats only appeared once the new book delivery arrived, which also makes me question why Jimmy gets the blame. Like, assuming the nerds were indoors, surely they could see the rats coming from the crate. Though, like, Jimmy's a student, he's not employed by Crabblesnitz to deal with ordering books and supplies for the school. And, as said, you know, Ernest could vouch for Jimmy not being there. Anyway, after this, Jimmy visits the gym and gets called alongside again by an angry Mr. Burton, who flat out accuses Jimmy of arson and burning down his gym. Once again, why is Jimmy getting the blame for this? I really don't see any actual reason for him to be blamed here. So Jimmy offers to go and save some students who are unfortunately trapped in the fire, and somehow the gym has more equipment in it inside the usual and piles of trash. Okay, surely whoever did this must have took hours dragging in all that trash and then set it on fire. Honestly, Jimmy is not to blame here, everybody else is. Like, I bet if I went to drag that much trash into my local gym they'd soon kick me as soon as I dumped the first lot on the floor. The only people to blame here are the jocks for being that bloody stupid and Burton for being that bloody blind. Anyway, after rescuing everyone and putting out the fires, Mandy tells Jimmy she saw somebody downstairs who was responsible. When Jimmy goes to investigate, this person attacks Jimmy and then runs out of the gym. Now, either Mr. Burton is that much of a hateful petty jackass, or everybody is that dumb. But if I was near a burning building and I hear somebody run out the building saying I regret nothing, and have somebody else point out that guy was responsible, I'm pretty sure everybody would realise Jimmy's innocence and give him a well-earned apology. However, they don't because, well, everybody's a, um, insert obscenity here, towards Jimmy. So after this, Jimmy heads down to New Coventry and he sees Lola and Norton arguing over Johnny Vincent, who's disappeared. Once again, Jimmy gets blamed, and I'm not repeating myself again, but this mission has some nice detail to it which I'll quickly replay from my attention to detail video which I made last year. In the introduction to chapter 5, we can see Jimmy conversing with all the clique leaders, Ted Thompson, Ernest Jones, Darby Harrington and Johnny Vincent. But then Jimmy goes to talk to Pete and all the clique leaders go on their way. The next mission, the first mission of chapter 5, which is making a mark, the cutscene once again has all the leaders, except for Johnny Vincent. This is because within the next few missions, we learn Johnny Vincent has gone missing and he was admitted into Happy Vault's asylum, 
His absence in this mission's cutscene is a very subtle hint that he went missing after the introduction to Chapter 5. Anyway, this mission is definitely one of the creepiest in the entire game, as it's a stealth based mission where we have to break into the insane asylum, which we've never been introduced to in the game before. And this mission does a fantastic job of setting a mysterious tone with the ominous soundtrack. But I feel more could have been done with Jimmy finding the asylum. Like, say, having Jimmy ask around where this asylum is instead of somehow knowing where it is despite never visiting it. Also, forcing the player to find their own way in instead of just marking the tree on Jimmy's map, which he can use on his first ever visit. But, mm, what can you do, really? Aside from those small plot holes, at least Johnny knows his escape plan when Jimmy finds him instead of Jimmy somehow knowing how to escape and free every inmate. Now, the next part of the story is when Jimmy first meets Zoe, and the pair decide to get revenge on Mr. Burton for being a jackass and, well, being a pervert. Now, a bit of a weird mission for story consistency, and the whole everyone hates Jimmy story, but I think it works well if you think of this mission as Jimmy getting revenge for Mr. Burton, for nearly getting Jimmy arrested for arson he didn't commit. I think it's a really fitting mission for that reason only, and I think it's a great introduction to Zoe. Another weird oddity with this mission is how Zoe knows Jimmy's a Bullworth student even if he isn't wearing a uniform. Now, it could be a weird coincidence, but seeing Mr. Burton covered in waste is probably one of the most satisfying parts of the game. As we know, what we've discussed in person is in other missions. So, straight after humiliating Burton, we're taken back to our Everybody Hates Jimmy storyline again, where this time Jimmy stops by the Preps Boxing Gym only to get accused by Darby for stealing boxing trophies, again accused with no proof at all. Darby, thankfully, then accuses the Greasers and then goes to declare war on them before Jimmy stops them. Now, this cutscene works incredibly well as it plays off the Preppy Greaser rivalry decently and it also shows how the tensions around Bullworth and the Academy are in this mission. Also, in this mission it's revealed the town is behind everything, but I feel like the twist, if you can even call it that, isn't really that shocking when Jimmy meets one in the gym is burning, and Johnny mentions them after being freed from the asylum. I mean, it's, you know, just not unexpected. After getting photo evidence of the townies burning the preppy's trophies, Jimmy returns to show Darby his photo, and they basically argue over how Jimmy's to blame somehow. With Darby basically telling Jimmy to shove his photo where the sun doesn't shine, I think the ending does a great job of showcasing how stuck their own... Uh, well, you know, the preppies really are. They don't care for the truth, they just want an excuse to fight the greasers for any reasons they could find. Also, you'd think of how rich the preppies are, you'd think they would be able to afford some CCTV in the boxing gym. But seeing Darby's response, they probably could give less of a damn when they saw Greaser involved somehow. Also, one thing that confuses me in this part of the story is how Jimmy somehow knows Gary's working with the townies, like we don't see or hear anything that hints at this, so either Jimmy's just flat out assuming this, or maybe there's some cut content where it's flat out revealed Gary is working with them. You know, maybe like the twist in GTA San Andreas where Caesar calls CJ and they find out Smoke and Rido are working with Tenpenny and the Ballers. The next morning, Jimmy wakes up to a very angry Miss Danvers shouting for Jimmy to come into the office where Dr. Crabble Snitch knows Jimmy was behind the tag on City Hall, and proceeds to expel him. I think this is a great turning point as it's very fit into Gary's character and shows how desperate he was to take over the school and he saw Jimmy as a threat and seeing Jimmy having every click on his side probably added to that threat level. And by having Gary take his chance to snitch on Jimmy and destroy everything Jimmy's worked for it's a fantastic way to reintroduce Gary to the story as our main antagonist. However, around this point I have very mixed feelings on how Gary was handled as our antagonist. But past chapter 1 Gary only appears twice. And in one of those appearances, Gary isn't even bothering with Jimmy compared to the other Rockstar games where we're always reminded of our antagonists who make regular appearances throughout the story to screw everything up for us. But Gary wasn't really doing that. Like in all the chapters, we have different antagonists. Tad in Chapter 2, Lola in Chapter 3, Ted in Chapter 4, and the Townies in Chapter 5. However, with that being said, from Jimmy's point of view, Gary was handled well because Jimmy just does not care about him at all. I think past chapter 3 we clearly see Jimmy just forgets about him and carries on his year at Bullworth and since Gary isn't making himself known to Jimmy, why should he care? As far as Jimmy's concerned, Gary's just a backstabber who shouldn't be trusted. So after being expelled, Jimmy rants a bit at Pete and while they both know Gary was behind getting Jimmy expelled, Jimmy is unsure if Gary was behind the town's antics, which does retract what he said to Darby, which is good since it makes more sense that way. However, once again we have another oddity, a bit like the rumble where Jimmy says he's going to take on the townies and finds Russell. However, Jimmy doesn't know where Russell lives, nor does Jimmy know where the townies hideout is either. So this mission is a bit weird like that. However, this can be somewhat explained by cut content again, where the original cutscene for this mission still exists in the game's files, and had Jimmy directly say his plan to bust into the hideout to teach Edgar a lesson. Which to me implies there was a story change of how the townies were handled in this mission. Or well, chapter entirely to be honest. Especially since we've never met this Edgar. 
Now speaking of that, Edgar is handled pretty badly here. As soon as Russell launches a suicide attempt, Zoe runs up and Jimmy says I gotta talk to that Edgar kid. Even though we don't know who this Edgar kid is, we've never met him or heard that name before. I think that furthers my point about how there might have been cut content for the townies were handled for this chapter, or the shocking twist, but I just think it's a bit weird. Now as Jimmy makes his way to Edgar, we chase him through a power plant, for arguably the most badass fight in the entire game. I mean come on, we're in a chemical plant. Now after beating Edgar, he reveals the only reason why all this happened was because Gary told him they'd make everyone pay. Which, once again, is never really hinted at, nor do we have any evidence, so I'll repeat what I said earlier. I don't see or hear anything that hints at this, so either Jimmy's just flat out assuming this, or maybe there's some cut content where it's flat out revealed Gary is working with them. You know, I've made the twists twist in GTA San Andreas where Caesar calls CJ and they find out Smoke and Ryder are working with Tenpenny in the boilers. Anyway, while Jimmy was busy fighting Edgar, the entire academy has erupted into World War 3. Their complete mayhem is a better date the perfect representation of Gary's plans. I think this was brilliantly hinted at with Darby wanting to wage war on the Greasers for nothing, and I think all the different click encounters in this mission give us some very fitting insights as to why each click is fighting. For example, Ernest is fighting because Gary manipulated him into thinking they'll rule the school. Darby isn't fighting, but instead he's residing in Harrington House in a fancy rope and slippers, basically confirming he was just looking for an excuse to get his click to fight, which was hinted at in Preppy's Vandalize. Now because Russell and Edgar are on Jimmy's side, the buddies and townies aren't participating in this war as they're aware of Gary's plans. Now of course this mission is exaggerated quite a bit about every click somehow being everywhere at once, and people being knocked out only to quickly run back in to the fight, and I think that kind of exaggeration works well in this mission. After issuing reminders to click leaders about how they work for Jimmy, he enters the school to find Edgar who's beaten up some bullies, which works well as how he's hate school kids and vice versa, but for some reason the prefects are in here and they quickly swarm Jimmy. You'd think they'd be going after Edgar, but I guess this is a sign they're under Gary's control, or they're just that incompetent. But after this, Gary taunts Jimmy and Final Showdown begins. Now, I think Final Showdown and everything about this mission sets the tone perfectly, from the soundtrack to the dark rainy weather. I think it also does a great job at showcasing Gary's scenario, as he's now fallen and he's been chased to the point of no return, but Gary is finally going to get what's coming to him for what he did to Jimmy, and the cutscenes are fantastic at showing the tension between the two, with Jimmy confronting Gary asking about what he did wrong, to Gary saying Jimmy would have backstabbed him anyway if he had the chance. It really does highlight Gary's mental problems, and I think this was hinted at the reason back in chapter 1 when Gary says he stopped taking his medication. But having Gary's personal issues have been the reason how Gary turned out in the story is a really unique twist on the cliche antagonist, because you don't have a reason why Gary hates Jimmy, but his mental issues make him assume Jimmy hates him instead. The final fight between the two isn't the most difficult fight ever, but it works well because Gary himself is not a fighter, he's more of a thinker and it shows of how easily he's taken down by Jimmy, who's had his fair share of fights throughout the entire game. Now as the scaffolding collapses underneath them both, somehow Jimmy is unscathed, and while Gary's knocked out on the floor with Crab Snitch saying hey Gary's now expelled, because he heard Gary's confession and list of crimes before the fight. However, I covered this in my theory video, but I don't know how Crab Snitch got tired of without knowing it was Gary unless either the townies did it or Gary himself knocked Crabbleson out just to tie him up. Now the ending itself is a decent one as everyone realises Jimmy was innocent all along, well excluding the tag of course, but Jimmy also helps his friends by getting Zoe reinstated at Bullworth and getting Mr Byrne fired and Pete hired to be the head boy. I think the ending wraps up most things nicely as Edgar and Russell seem to have helped break up the fight. Jimmy's ending monologue is short but fits the ending rather neatly, by saying everything is sorted out more or less it's a good quote to apply for the side missions the player may not have done yet and to wrap up some side stories for other characters. And the quote of, I'm not saying we're going to live happy ever after, but life is certainly going to get easier, is a good realistic quote to end with as well, as Jimmy's year at Bullworth is drawing to an end. But at the same time, life is going incredibly well for him. He's defeated Gary, he's gone reinstated at the academy, he's cleared his name, he's got himself a girlfriend, and at the same time, Jimmy's only 15, he's still got his whole life ahead of him, and we know life is never really a permanent happy ride. But our story with Jimmy ends here on a very happy note as he's cheered on by most people at the academy including the staff. Now overall I feel the story to Buddy is great and deals with some excellent character building and puts the entire map and clicks to good use. However at the same time the story is plagued with plot holes, inconsistencies and weird stuff. Like the Ted vs Ernest election story, why Ernest turned on Jimmy in chapter 4, how Gary and the Tonys are working together and all that. This kind of stuff does ruin the story a bit but I reckon most of it can be explained through cut content. But I don't think Rockstar had enough time to really fix the plot inconsistencies in time. But when Bully's story does remain consistent, it throws together some really good plots, and I like how they all vary from being realistic, you know, with like Johnny and Lola's story in Chapter 3, 
and Jimmy being the new kid in the first chapter, to the unrealistic and slightly wacky, with like chapter 4 and the nurse defending the observatory from waves of jocks used the spud cannons. All complete mayhem where all of a sudden there's like clones of everybody joining the fight, while somehow not being too out there either. Now Body is not the most lore deep game ever, especially compared to other games like, you know, the GTA series or even some of the Fallout games like Fallout New Vegas. So if you really love lore deep stuff, Body might disappoint you a bit there, mostly because there hasn't been a sequel or a prequel to it yet. So to be fair, there is really no lore to go off yet. However, if Rockstar do decide to make a Buddy 2 at some point, I hope they can tie into Buddy 1 somehow. You know, like how all the GTA games are tied in somehow. Or like, you know, Red Dead Redemption. So I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, be sure to subscribe for more Buddy content, and if you want to support me in a more personal manner, consider becoming a member of my channel. That being said, thanks for watching, I hope to see you all at the next video.